from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'll, I'll give the right. first. Okay. So, all right, so today is, I believe, the 11th of May, 2013. We're in Seattle, Washington. Uh, you're listening to the voice of David Klein for uh, Virginia Tech, also on behalf of the Southern Oral History Program at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, today, uh, we are um, visiting uh, with Aaron Dixon, and uh, behind the camera today is John Bishop from Media Generation and UCLA. And this project is, this is the Civil Rights History Project for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very mm -hmm. much for making time mm -hmm. for us being part of this project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do to start is just, is to, add, to start with your, um, your childhood, but, but tell us about the family into which you were born uh, where and mm -hmm. uh, how they may have influenced you mm -hmm. as you grew up. Okay. Uh, my, um, let me see. My mother, uh, her parents came from Mississippi. <clears throat> and um, her, uh, she was, um, she was heavily influenced by her grand, her great-grandmother. Uh, who was born in 1867, <clears throat> uh, Emma. And uh, Emma's mother was a slave. Um, and at some point she, she got, you know, she became free and uh, she did live, uh, live the life of a free woman. Uh, but she was uh, intertwined with the whole history of slavery. And um, and so her kids, particularly my great great grandmother Emma, uh, you know, was born into the whole era of Jim Crow, and uh, you know, had it. It was very difficult for her to find work. The only work that, that Emma could find was as a laundress, and she worked for many many years as a laundress. And uh, <clears throat> she had, uh, I believe, seven kids and. I think uh, four of them died, uh, you know, fairly young. And um, her husband uh, also died in a tragic accident because I believe he was a brakeman. Mm. And um, so um, <clears throat> my grandmother, uh, Emma's great-granddaughter, or no, Emma's uh, granddaughter, actually, was um, a product of a uh, relationship between a Jewish man and her mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I understand, her mother was ostracized. This was in Mississippi. Her mother was ostracized by the rest of the family because she had this relationship. Um, and so uh, my grandmother's mother passed away when my grandmother was only three years old. So mm -hmm. she really didn't get to know her mother mm -hmm. and she didn't know anything about her father, a Jewish man. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so eventually she was sent to Chicago to be raised by an aunt, her sisters, uh, one of her mother's sisters. And, um, and then part of the time she was raised by Emma. A good portion of the time she was raised by Emma in Mississippi. <clears throat> um, so uh, my grandmother met Roy Sledge, her husband, and uh, Roy's father was a uh, blacksmith, mm -hmm. one of the only few blacksmiths in Mississippi. <clears throat> at the time, who rode around in a white horse, from what I understand. <laughs> mm. And, uh, and, and, and but, for himself, so he would have yeah, some independence. Yeah. yeah. So his, uh, my grandfather's, uh, I believe, uh, his mother was half Native American. Mm. Um, so, um, let me see, um, 
So then my mother was born to this union of Roy Sledge, who was half Native American, uh, and um, my uh, her mother, uh, um, Josephine Sledge, uh, who was her birth name was jo, uh, Joe, Joe Willie, that was her birth name, and so uh, they. Uh, yeah, so they, you know, they moved to Chicago as part of the migration of blacks from the South, mm -hmm. and um, my uh, mother was, uh, you know, raised in in Chicago and and Milwaukee and St. Paul. So anyway, um, my grandfather Roy, he uh, worked uh, as a Pullman porter. Uh, became addicted, uh, uh, became an uh, alcoholic, um, and at times was estranged from the family. Um, eventually, he, you know, became sober and stayed sober for the remaining years of his life. He, I believe, he was about 32 years old, and he was able to get a job at the post office where he retired. Um, now, his, um, my mother, uh, her mother. Uh, Josephine had started her out at playing piano when she was five, and she became a child prodigy on the piano <clears throat> and began playing concerts when she was seven years old. Mm. And um, and uh, eventually, she would graduate from high school when she was sixteen. Uh, my then we'll switch to my father's family. My father's family uh, came from Kentucky, and uh, his uh, grand, actually going back uh, past, and on his mother's side, uh, their family inherited uh, the, the plantation uh, because of slave owners. Uh, the slave owners had had some relationship with my great 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 grandmother. I think you know they had a a relationship, mm -hmm. and so when he left, when slavery ended, he took his family to Denver and he gave the plantation mm -hmm. to uh, the woman that he had the relationship with, right. and so uh, and. Also, on my grandmother's side, my, my father's side, his, um, my grandmother had two great-great-uncles who served in the Civil War. Mm. And when they returned from the Civil War, they actually got land for being in the Civil War. And they took that land. And I'm not in clear where this land was, but it was part of the land they got from the plantation. Okay. And they uh, started their own town called Brooksville. So what side did they fight on? Uh, on the, they fought, fought on the north. Oh, okay. They were one of the f some of the first uh, black soldiers to volunteer to fight mm -hmm. on the north. Mm -hmm. And and it it goes way back. It goes further back. Some someone else in the fa on that side of the family has traced it back to royalty in in um, in um, Scotland, mm -hmm. where there's a coat of arms and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I just remember that my grandmother on my father's side always spoke very proudly of her family and mm -hmm. her side of the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, in the house that she lived in in Chicago, they had a lot of the furniture that came from that plantation. Oh, yeah. um, and now her father, I'm sorry, her husband, uh, my father's father, uh, was... Um, I think maybe one quarter or maybe half Native American, mm -hmm. but he never knew who his mother was. He was raised by his aunt, mm -hmm. and his father left and went to St. Louis and became a millionaire. Mm -hmm. And so um, my grandfather, uh, his name was Elmer, and uh, my grandmother, Mildred, they met and they married and they moved. And they had, my father was born in Henderson, Kentucky, and they moved to Chicago along with that great migration. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so my grandfather on my father's side, Elmer Dixon, he uh, found work 
while working, or working for a wealthy Jewish man. I'm not sure what capacity, but he, he was making enough money where he never allowed his wife to work. His wife never worked. Um, and uh, so he had my father and he had another daughter, um, Doris, my aunt. And uh, they were raised in Chicago. Um, and my um, father uh, started taking classes at the Art Institute at a young age, and he got a scholarship to the Art Institute at a young age. He was also captain of the ROTC in Chicago. And um, when World War II uh, broke out, uh, he saw the uh, news at the movie theaters, because that's where they had the news at, at the movie theaters, mm -hmm. about, the world, about the attack on Pearl Harbor. He runs down to the induction center and he wants to join, and he's told that we don't take boys like you. So when he graduates, though, the Army is right there waiting for him. And so he's drafted into the Army along with many of his uh, fellow black soldiers. They're sent to Mississippi. And, uh, and, you know, I talk about in my book, there's a lot of stories he talks about in Mississippi and the trials and tribulations of being in such a volatile place mm -hmm. uh, and as a member of the military and being black. And uh, things get so bad that, you know, he, he writes his mother and is telling her what's going on, and she writes Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and, uh, you know, Can you I, talk just a little bit more about that? So what kinds of things were going on that you told Yeah, you sure. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the stories is that they are, uh, him and his fellow soldiers are out on marching, on, I think it's called Bivouac, and they're out marching in the hot sun and uh, hot, humid Mississippi sun, and uh, they come across this farm, and they want to march across the farm so they would, won't have to go through the swamps. Mm -hmm. And uh, the white officer asked the farmer if they could march across the, his farm, his fields, and the uh, white farmer points his shotgun at the uh, soldiers and says, no niggers are going to march across my field. So they have to go through the swamps. But when they camp down that night, my father and some of his uh, friends go back and burn down the barn of the, uh, of the farmer. Uh, another story is that he meets a very light-complected woman in, in, the, in the small town mm -hmm. near the base. And, uh, you know, in, in the deep south, you know, where they don't know who you are, it becomes very dangerous. And so he uh, wants, on their date, they're out, and he wants to walk her back across town home. And she says, no, you know, you, you, sh you probably shouldn't do that, you know. But, you know, being from Chicago, you know, he, uh, the whole gentleman thing, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So he convinces her that that's what he's going to do, and he's got his uniform on. So he walks her across town, he's getting a lot of stares at people, um, and uh, uh, this white sergeant uh, stops him and tells him, uh, you know, boy, uh, when I come back through here, you better not be here. And so, what, no, he asks him why he, he's here, what are you doing, and he says, you know, I'm walking my friend home. He said, well, you better not be here when I get back. So my father stops off at the post office on his way to walk her home, and he writes his mother and tells his mother that his uh, life is in danger. Mm -hmm. So he continues walking her home, and and just you know fortunate that he didn't run into this sergeant, and he makes it back to the base. Um, and this is a felt. This is another uh, person in the army. This isn't even a local guy that's that's harassing. Oh, this is a police. Uh, oh, this is the the town sheriff. Oh, the town sheriff. The town okay. sheriff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, the final incident was that uh, I'm sure there are many others, but um, him and his fellow soldiers were uh, preparing to go out on furlough for the weekend, and uh, the command or, or the sergeant comes in and tells them that their furlough is canceled, that they have to clean 
Instead of going on furlough, they have to clean the toilets of the white soldiers. And so they refuse to do that, and they start a riot and start throwing everything out uh, onto the courtyard. And uh, this riot lasts for you know quite a while. And finally, they bring a train in, and and they ship them out. And then my father finally goes to the Pacific Theater, fights in the Philippines, fights in Okinawa. Um, while in Okinawa, he sees a Marine cut the breast off of a dead Japanese woman and hold it up in the air. And my f father just just got lost control and grabbed his gun and was going to shoot this Marine. But he stopped by, you know, his, his fellow comrades stopped him from doing it. And so after that incident, he goes AWOL. Mm. Um, and um, he meets a Japanese family in, I believe it was in Korea, and uh, he spends time with them. And then he comes back, and uh, and then he is sent back home. And, uh, and, you know, that changed his perspective of his nation, that incident, seeing the, what the Marine did. And uh, he started, you know, seeking out other things, and he started being involved in Paul Robeson's Youth Brigade mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and starts, uh, you know, flirting with the Communist Party. I don't think he actually joined the Communist Party, but, you know, he's flirting with the Communist Party. So uh, he gets out of the Army, he meets my mother, they get married, and he's a student um, at a in junior college, eventually goes to the Iron Institute and, and graduates. And my mother had started Teachers College, and they started having kids. Um, and so uh, my father gets a job at Chanute Air Force Base as a technical illustrator. So the family moves to Champaign, Illinois, and we lived there for uh, maybe about four years or so. Um, and I, there is a time, I do remember, when some men in, in black suits came to visit my father. He didn't let them in the house. I'm assuming they were the FBI. Um, and then he gets a job offer. Uh, he gets several job offers, and one of them is from Boeing in Seattle. He remembers Seattle when he uh, came through uh, on his way back from the war and on his way to the war, he mm -hmm. spent time in Seattle. So he thought it would be a good place to move his family. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Seattle, uh, I believe in 57, 58. And, um, and, you know, we move around. So the black community in Seattle gets larger during the war, right? Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, it does. It's the, and, you know, people coming in to work at Todd Shipyard, that, you know, blacks coming in. California, they're coming in to work in the munitions factories. They were coming up here to work in the uh, airplane war factories. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's when a lot of black people do start coming uh, west, mm -hmm. is, is during the war. Mm -hmm. We're back. And there okay. are particular parts of town <coughs> where, where black folks. Yeah, so, well, mainly the central area. Mm -hmm. The central area was primarily where black people lived. Also, uh, with Chinese and Filipinos and um, Japanese mm -hmm. and some Native Americans, uh, pretty much were all grouped up in the central area. Mm -hmm. And um, let me see, my parents, uh, we finally found a house that we were going to settle down in. My parents bought a house in Madrona mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood. And, um, and... How would you describe that neighborhood, Madrona? Madrona it was a neighborhood of big old houses, lots of trees, it just a really, a really beautiful neighborhood. And it's connected to a series of other neighborhoods. There's uh, Harrison Valley, there's Madrona, there's Leschi, there's Mount Baker, and these are really nice neighborhoods, and the lake is to the west, to the east, you know, so, you know, we've got views of the mountain, of the lake, uh, not far from downtown. Uh, you know, it's really, it was a very, really nice growing up in, uh, 
in that neighborhood and all those other neighborhoods. It was predominantly black, mm -hmm. uh, Filipino, Japanese, and Chinese. And all the grocery stores were all Chinese owned, the little small grocery stores. And they gave credit to everybody. And you know, we all went to school together all the, with the, all the Japanese, Filipino, Chinese, and you know, so, you know, growing up, it was, you know, it was almost like we didn't, it wasn't any distinction between mm -hmm. our nationalities almost. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and then there were whites that still, that hadn't fled uh, to Bellevue, to the east side and other places that had stayed there. And so it was, it was a, a, a and, and those whites who had, had stayed were, you know, whites that had decided, you know, that they weren't going to move, they were gonna, just going to participate on, in this new thing that was happening, you know. Right. So, uh, you know. They were in your class. Those kids would be in your class. Yes, too. yeah, yeah. So um, it was, it was really, we were really very fortunate to, to grow up in that type of environment. Now, outside of those neighborhoods, you know, there was a, the, the usual racism, you know, there was a police brutality. There was a difficulty with finding jobs. You know, my mother had a difficult time finding a job, um, and she had doors closed closed on her. Because, and because of race? Because of race. Do you remember any particular? Uh, Frederick and Nelson's, a store called Frederick and Nelson's. It's owned by Macy's now, but it was the main um, retail store, the largest retail store in Seattle, Frederick and Nelson's. And she had a difficult time. She was, you know, went in there one time when they had a sign open for hiring. And that you know she was told we're not hiring, you know. So, but eventually she did get a job, you know. And um, and um, you know we, growing up, we we lived we lived right across the street from a park, and the park was had people there, you know, during the summertime, and there was a lot of different programs, and you know, and because you know this the baby boom generation, just a lot of kids, and 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 people had. Big families, you know. I'm mm -hmm. talking about our family was considerably small with four kids, you know, mm -hmm. two brothers and a sister and myself. Uh, but you know, there were families that had like seven, eight kids, you know, mm -hmm. <coughs> big kids. I mean, big families, and um, and you know, almost all of them were two parent families, you know, mm -hmm. and and hard working, hard working parents and. Um, and many of them had come from the south and other parts, and um, and so and my father, being an artist, and my father, you know, he loved other people of other cultures. You know, he 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 just felt a need to always connect with people of other cultures, and so in doing so, he met some artists and <coughs> people who were in the theater and other arts. Um, and he got involved in the uh, folk dancing group, and they had a folk dancing group. And it was, you know, people of, you know, Greek, Jewish, um, Italian, and black, and, um, and, and you know, they, they met at different people's homes to do their dancing, and they met at our house quite often, mm -hmm. you know, and pulled the rug back and bring the wine out and <laughs> <laughs> the music, and they were doing their folk folk dancing. So, you know, this is the kind of environment we grew up in. Mm -hmm. And we uh, all of us uh, kids, we were required to play an instrument. You know, all the, all the kids were required to play an instrument. This was my grandmother uh, in Chicago, my mother's mother. She was a very kind of dominating, kind of controlling type of woman, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, so she bought the instruments for everybody. Everyone will play something. Everybody's gonna play something. <laughs> and I, I was, I was told I was gonna play the violin. Okay. <laughs> so not that I didn't like the violin, I did, but I, I just never quite could grasp the whole reading notes and everything. Mm -hmm. And I bought my violin home, and it was broken one day, and so that was it for me. <laughs> my younger brother, he took up the violin. He played it all the way through until he graduated from high school. <coughs> Elmer played the uh, trumpet. He started out with the, um, with the guitar, then he played the trumpet all the way, and my sister played the piano. Um, so and my mother oftentimes played the piano, and my father was, you know, trying to do 
his artwork on the side sometimes, and he did have a um, a showing of, of of his artwork at the Fry Museum. Oh, cool. uh, so, he was an illustrator, right? Yeah, he was a technical illustrator, Good and boy. and his friends at Boeing who worked with him, they said he was the best best artist out there. Um, so, but. Uh, I, I know that he was really frustrated that he really n didn't have the time, uh, the large amount of time that is needed to just really work on your art. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also was a poet as well, and, and he, you know, he, he, he wrote poetry and he exposed us to poetry. Um, you know, I learned um, Shakespeare from my father. You know, I could, I could quote uh, different parts of Shakespeare. Um, uh, because my father was was doing it, you know. Um, so um, uh, then, you know, we also participated in in sports. It, you know, my father didn't really push sports, so we kind of, you know, because we lived across the street from the park. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, you know, we were very much involved in football, baseball. Basketball, tennis. We played a lot of tennis. My my brother Michael, he played. Uh, he got a scholarship to UCLA to play tennis and ping pong and all those things. And we played in the tournaments at the, with the parks department. Um, and now, would there would there be incidents there with, uh, playing on, on sports teams in terms of in terms of race at all? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but there was, I mean, there was always fights amongst each other. You know, there were so many kids. We all, you know, there was always the fights. You know, we got in the fights. But when we were on the softball team and we went to other areas like Ballard, and Queen Anne, to say play other softball teams, yeah, there was there was a lot of tension and a lot of you know calls going the wrong way. And uh, there was, yeah, there was a lot, and, and people, black people didn't even go to Ballard. You couldn't really go to Ballard. You couldn't go to Queen Anne. You know, that was, that was unforbidden territory, particularly if you were young. Uh, and even in high school, you know, uh, you know they turned into, into fights and almost riots between, you know, some of those schools, Ballard and Queen Anne. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really extremely racially charged. A lot of times, you know, uh, playing some of those teams. Um, so, um, you know, even though we were in this cocoon, you know, there was always that element outside that racism that we always knew about and we always heard about. You know. Did, let me know that question. Go back. Did, do you remember your folks talking to you about what it meant to be to be black, or sort of how, how your own race consciousness developed? Uh, well, you know, we... Well, it's hard to sort of define that moment. Yeah, well, you know, uh, they never really, they, they just told stories. Mm -hmm. They told stories, you know, that, that oral tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, we got the stories from my grandparents, and we got stories from my great-grandparents and our aunts and our uncles whenever we went back to Chicago. We were constantly hearing stories, and they were constantly telling us all the time. And, and when they were talking amongst themselves, we would hear stories, you know, all, always, you know, this racism and things that are going on. <coughs> but I never, our parents never just directly said this is that and this is what's going on, you know, but, um, you know, we, we were able to understand. I remember when I was 13 and I said I wanted to be a policeman, my parents got real angry and said, no, you're not going to be no policeman. Hmm. And I remember when I uh, was 16 years old and I said I wanted to Joined the Marines and going to Vietnam, and my father got the uh, angriest I've ever seen him, mm. saying that you know no son of his is going to go to Vietnam, and there were you know people going being drafted to go to Vietnam all the time. You know a lot of people that we knew mm -hmm. were in Vietnam. Um, so and that was based on his own experience. His own experience. His yeah. his own experience. Yeah. And. Um, so and did they involve you in politics at all, or I, I think wasn't there a visit when King came to town when you were? Yeah, you know? yeah. I um, you know, we had you know political discussions. We just had discussions in the kitchen. The kitchen was always the place where we had discuss. And the older we got, the more broader they got, mm -hmm. and the more volatile they got. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and so um, let me see. When I was, you know, around twelve or thirteen years old, I I marched with Martin Luther King when he came to Seattle. Then I started getting involved in in the demonstrations uh, around town. You know, I remember when George Wallace came to town. You know, we demonstrated against that and 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 some other things. And I, you know, I was only like twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old. So. I was the only one, and my my brothers and sisters they weren't. I don't. I'm not sure how that happened, how I get in, got involved, but I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it might have been through my our church or something like that. Um, so uh, I graduated from high school in uh, 1967 by the skin of my teeth, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I had started working when I was a junior in high school. I worked a full-time job. I, I worked, and during the summer, I worked 14 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. I bought my own clothes. I bought my own records. I bought, I was determined I was going to be independent. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I had, a, I had a job and I didn't mind working, you know. And even before that, you know, we are, most of us, my generation, we cut grass. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to people's houses. We cut grass. You know, I had a paper route when I was uh, in in middle school. I had in the s seventh grade. I had a paper route where I had to get up at six o'clock every morning and to go deliver papers. <laughs> and that was it, it. It became too tough and too much of a strain. And so I, I only had that for a month. But Elmer got a evening paper route job that he did after he came home mm -hmm. from school. And so I had to help him with that. Mm -hmm. And he had that for a year. A paper route. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, right on. <laughs> right on. You don't right hear about on. it anymore. <laughs> no, you don't. Anymore, you don't hear about that or, anymore. Uh, adults drive in cars yeah. and throw them out the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. So, um, so yeah, I, I graduated and then I was trying to, you know, figure out what I was going to do. Uh, you know, my, our parents had always told us we were going to go to college. So, um, uh, but I, I hadn't had any prospects yet. I wanted to go to Tennessee State uh, and, you know, that's where my aunt went. And most uh, people my age and older were going to black colleges. That's, that's, where, they were, that's where their destination was. And that's where I wanted to go to school, but my grades weren't good enough to get in Tennessee State, so I was turned down. So I started, uh, and when Stokely Carmichael came to town, I really got fired up, you know. I, and uh, I think Elmer was with me and my good friend Michael Dean. And, uh, and then I started wearing those Stokely Carmichael glasses, and uh, I started, you know, really really evolving and really growing in my understanding of what the racial politics was in America. Would that have been when you first heard the, the term black power? Then, yeah, I think, yeah. Was, uh, well, I had heard it in the news, okay. yeah. but then this, you know, he had been traveling around the country, him and uh, H. Rap Brown. Right. And then, you know, wow, he's coming to Seattle. So I, I made sure I was there. <coughs> and... Um, that really changed that. That just like blew us into another direction, you know, mm -hmm. to really start thinking about. Plus, all, all these things are going on in America, you know, the riot in our Los Angeles in 1965, right, right. and uh, you know the continuous riots after that every summer, and the whole civil rights movement and everything that's going on. Not to mention that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Yeah. And as was uh, uh, my father cried when that happened when he, he was did. assassinated, um, and you know it really was devastating to the black community because it was the first time we had a president that really stood up and and was going to support mm -hmm. what black people was doing. So um, did, was his picture up in your in their in their home? I'm just curious. I don't, I don't yeah, know I'm sure that yeah they yeah. had some kind of picture I'm somewhere. Curious what pictures were? Yeah, on they had. Um, um, let me see, what kind of picture? Well, my, there was artwork on, on the one, but some of my father's artwork and, and, and other artwork. Uh, and there was a bust of Beethoven who we later found out was, uh, you know, was, was black. Um, so, um, but we did listen to a lot of Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. 
Paul Robeson, um, um, what's his name, and out of Harlem, um, uh, that con that congressman. Um, oh, uh, uh, Powell. Yeah. 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 And uh, and uh, records of Martin Luther King and um, and we listen to a lot of opera, a lot of musicals, a lot of classical music, a lot of jazz. You know, there was music was a big part of our family. You know, it was it was always being played uh, in the house. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me see, I. Go you to where you're, yeah, you're yeah. out of high school. So after school after school. After, yeah. after Stokely, yeah. Yeah. that's it. You know, yeah. I'm all I'm all fired up. So I'm at my job one day and uh, I have I have my Ray Ban sunglasses on and I'm wearing them on the job and my afro's getting bigger and I'm uh, and the uh, I worked in this uh, uh, Line this kind of, it was a conveyor belt, and everybody you know had to put dishes on the on the trays, and I had to call them out, you know what was it was you know um, sugar free or whatever uh, um, type of diet it was, and I messed up a couple of times as I had my sunglasses on, <laughs> and so the supervisor tells me to take my sunglasses off. Oh, why did she tell me that? I just blew up, and I lit into her with all these profanities mm. and walked out, walked off my job. I'd had that job for about three years. Mm. And so now, you know, I don't have a job, I'm not in school, my you know, I'm hanging out with my friends. My mother tells me, you know, I gotta do something. So I found a, a little part time job uh working with a a a, a poverty program that was uh, um, was going around doing these racially racial skits, and so we're going like to schools and the programs and the different places, and you know we play these different roles. And then from that, I uh, met this uh, guy who was a playwright named Aaron Dumas, and he had written a play, and so uh, he asked me to be in his play. It's called General's Coup. Is about a craze. Is about a a, 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 a a black army that is raised up, and they march on the capital, and they started taking over the country, and they take over the White House, and the general is, gets crazy, and I'm his rational son, and and we play this play all over in coffee house. Well, they had coffee houses. That, well, they still got coffee houses, but they were bigger than they had coffee houses and you know and in schools we're doing this play and I really started getting into it you know and uh, so then after that we finished with that I, I I got into another play called Tom Jones and so I'm I'm also writing poetry I'm also writing a lot of poetry you know I'm getting into the theater um, I did I do a poetry reading at the Lynx uh, fine arts program I win a scholarship Five hundred dollar scholarship, <clears throat> and I meet this. Uh, <clears throat> I hear about this program from this Jewish woman named Mrs. Richmond. I went to school with her daughter. She works with the Urban League, and they started up this college program to help uh, blacks get into the University of Washington, mm -hmm. and they help get them jobs, and they do all this stuff. They get advisors for them, and all these things. So, ma'am, I took my SAT test, and I did good on it, and. September, I was at the University of Washington, and I was a student there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now the movement all around us is, is really catching steam. <clears throat> so I get involved with uh, some other black students there, and we start the first black student union mm -hmm. <clears throat> at the uh, University of Washington. Well, we're back on. Okay. <clears throat> The black students. So we so we start the Black Student Union, and so all us black students are meeting in the hub, and you know Ron Dellums is coming up from Oakland, and other organizers from San Francisco State, because they already started a big takeover, at San Francisco State, and so then we helped to form a PSU at Garfield High School, and um, and so um, hi, you wanna? Oh okay. Hi, honey. 
So, uh, ah, so, ooh. Who is this? This is uh, Talia, my granddaughter. Well, you're now in the record of the Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you're famous. So, anyway, so, uh, in, um, in our activities, so we're, you know, we're getting politicized constantly, you know. And uh, I remember hearing about this organization in Oakland called the Black Panther Party that marched on the Capitol in Sacramento. This was, I believe, uh, uh, in the summer of uh, 67, I believe it was, before I even had started, started school. And so, um, so anyway, you know, going through the BSU, we um, decided to have this demonstration at Franklin High School because there's a racial incident that occurred there, and plus they don't have any black, uh, any black or Asian staff mm. on the school uh, on the school staff. So yeah, we, let's pause and let's go yeah, on the first grandchild mm -hmm. we've had. Okay. Okay. okay, so we can go on. Now. Okay, so to uh, Franklin High School. Yeah, so we go to Franklin High School. We march on the school. We march into the office. The principal won't meet with us, so we march into his office and we're yelling and chanting and what were the saying our chants. Oh, it was the staff, uh, hiring of black staff. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and the incident that happened with the black student and that? the white student, they got in a the fight, the black student got kicked out, the white student remained in school. So uh, we wanted to address those two issues, but he refuses to meet with us. He, uh, and, and we march into his office and we're yelling our chants. So he decides to leave the school and he tells us staff to go home. And so the students are there. And so we get the students into the auditorium and we have a big rally. And so afterwards, we're feeling really like, yeah, man, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we, we did took something over. here. We <laughs> took over the school. We ran them out of there. So we're feeling really good. A week later, uh, I get arrested from my home and along with other leaders of the uh, demonstration and we're in the King County Jail. Charged with? Uh, uh, unlawful Assembly. The day is April 4th, 1968. Mm -hmm. And Walter Conkright comes on, announces Martin Luther King is assassinated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this we're was, in yeah, I mean, we're in jail and we, and, and then the riots are breaking out all of, across the country, even in Seattle, and young people are going crazy, and we want to be out there going crazy, but we can't. So I remember that evening going back to my bunk and saying to myself that, um, that you know, they killed Martin Luther King, a man of peace, <coughs> that now it's time for something else. Mm. And I decided that my picket sign was going to be replaced by a gun. Um, we had already had been doing some organizing with SNCC, and we had met this guy named Voodoo Man, who and we were all going over there to his house meeting, and he had some guns over there. And so the idea had already been implanted in our heads, along with Stokely Carmichael and others, that you know, armed violence was what was needed. So. Um, and did you look at it in terms of, of self-defense or, or yeah, something else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever, you know, yes. whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. However, we, I, I don't even think we had really even thought about it, you know. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't know what we were going to do with the guns. But it probably was more about self-defense because we had seen a lot of police brutality that had been taking place. So... Um, you know, then in the backdrop, you had, uh, you know, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro who had marched on Havana. And the movie had just came out about Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. And you had, the, you had the revolutionary movements that were taking place throughout South America, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and then as well as in Africa. So, you know, all over the world, actually, you had this kind of uprising of young people, you know, all Europe and France, London, you know, even in India, you know. So then you had the, um, the whole um, hippie movement and, and, the, and the movement against the anti-war, uh, the anti-war movement. 
<coughs> so that, you know, it just seemed like, okay, America is just, you know, getting ready to explode. You know, people want change. And so we finally got out of jail. Uh, and then I uh, was uh, ended up, um, we went down to the Black Student Union Conference in San Francisco. And um, while we were down there, we, uh, Bobby heard that Bobby Seale, the leader of the Black Panther Party, was coming to do the keynote address. Uh, so, but we also heard that, um, that there was a funeral of this panther who had been killed. Uh, his name was Little Bobby Hutton. He was known as Little Bobby Hutton. So we went over to his funeral, and we had stopped and got some berets before we went over there. And uh, we saw Marlon Brando standing out front with a black leather jacket on a black beret talking with Bobby Seale. We go into the church. Why did you, why did you stop to get the berets? Was it? Because that's what the Panthers wore, and mm -hmm. we wanted to fit in, you know. We wanted to fit in and uh, show solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we... Uh, we... Um, you know, go in and see the body of little Bobby and it's a very emotional setting. His mother, aunts are wailing and crying and reaching out to his body and these panthers are standing around the walls, you know, with their hands, arms folded, mm -hmm. you know, looking very uh, serious. Yeah. What were the circumstances of his, of his death? He was, uh, you know, it, it was because of Martin Luther King's death, you know, um, and that there were some Panthers that wanted to take revenge, and they went out on the streets. And it, it it's not wasn't something that was okayed by the leadership, but it was some people that decided they wanted to do this on their own. One of them was uh, a leader in the party. It was Eldridge Cleaver and David Hilliard too, as well. Eldridge, uh, Huey, and Bobby were were in in jail at the time. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow this thing to happen. Mm. So they decided to go out in the street to you know, try to do something. They uh, get in a confrontation with some police, a shootout ensues. Little Bobby Hutton and the Elders Cleaver run into this abandoned house. It's surrounded by police. They start shooting into the house. You know, this goes on for, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes, tear gas. And uh, finally, you know, they have to surrender. Uh, Bo little Bobby Hutton throws his rifle out the, the door and they come out with their hands up. Little Bobby Hutton is told to run towards a police car, and uh, he does, and they shoot him, and you know, shoot him about 20, 25 times, you know. And, uh, and not only was Bobby Hutton killed, but Elders Cleaver was wounded, and, uh, then he, and, and also put in jail, because he's an ex-felon now, mm. and they're gonna send him back to San Quentin, uh, David Hilliard, the national captain, is also arrested, um, and there's uh, 18 other Panthers that are all arrested, mm -hmm. and uh, another Panther that is wounded, and uh, these were early Panthers, these were early people, and yeah, so yeah. now they're taken off the streets. Um, I was going to say, it sounded like an effort to, to just gut the Panthers first. Yeah, it, yeah it, was, it, it really had a devastating effect. Mm. So that's the uh, that's what happened with little Bobby Hutton. And so so Bobby Seale comes over later on that evening after the funeral. He's very emotional. He comes with Kathleen Cleaver and um, and one of the wounded Panthers and he gives a speech that is very powerful, very emotionally charged. And uh, my brother and I after the speech along with Anthony where we make a beeline to where he's at. Mm -hmm. And we tell them we want a Black Panther Party chapter in Seattle. Um, and so a week later, he flies to Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, along with George Murray, the Minister of Education, who was also a professor at San Francisco State College, yeah. and was very much behind the big student strike they had there for Black Studies program. Right. Right. And um, <clears throat> how, how radical was the Black Student Union? I'm, I mean, I'm struck because they invited yeah. him to, to be the keynote. Right. Uh, so yeah. Um, well, the, the 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 thing is, is that the Black Panther Party was such a powerful force in the Bay Area, uh, and and an influencing force mm -hmm. 
and a growing force that you couldn't help but want to invite them. Plus, there were people, and, and there were people at San Francisco State who were in the Black Panther Party, you know? And there were a lot of the people who were in the BSU who associated and worked with the Black Panther Party. You know, you had Emory Douglas, who was the Minister of Culture of the Black Panther Party. He was a student there. You know, George Murray, the Minister of Education, was a professor there. Mm -hmm. So that whole student strike, uh, the Black Panther Party had a, had, was one of the most key elements in making that happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Bobby Seale comes to Seattle with George Murray, and, and there's about 20 people. We all meet at my mother's house, my parents' house. We meet over a two or three day period, and, uh, and you know, a couple of people bring their guns to the meeting. Um, and um, so he tells us what, it's, what you need to be in the Black Panther Party. You know, he starts off that you need to have two weapons and 2,000 rounds of ammunition. And uh, he also gives us a book list of 25 books that we're told we have to read, uh, and we have to read, study uh, two hours a day and have political education class twice a week. Um, and he, he's on his way to the East Coast to uh, organize other chapters and branches. He asked me to go with him, but I wasn't ready to go. Uh, I, you know, in the meeting he asked who's going to be the captain. And uh, I, it was, I was designated as the captain. So we started developing... Were you, were you up for that role, or were you voted into it, or how was... I was kind of it? voted into it. You know, everybody started pointing at me. Yeah. I don't know why, but they did. So... And you're 19 years old? Yeah, 19, yeah. and still a student at the UW. So a week later, I'm called to Oakland. I'm called, Bobby Seale calls me and tells me to come down. That was my first flight on the airplane. Uh, and I had my Black Panther uniform on, and I'm, you know, I am nervous, you know, about how I'm going to be accepted, you know, mm -hmm. by these guys. So at that point, what is the Black Panther uniform? It's a black uh, leather jacket, mm -hmm. uh, powder blue shirt with a black tie, black pants, uh, black beret, and black shoes, mm -hmm. or, or black combat boots. Uh, and so that was the uniform, the official uniform of the Black Panther Party, and that's what pa party members were required to wear most of the time. Right. And so, okay, I, um, I'm picked up at the airport by two Panthers, Robert Bay, who was a uh, Vietnam veteran, along with Tommy Jones, who is also a veteran uh, from the Navy, but he's from Tacoma, Washington. And Robert Bates, the captain. So they drive me over to the office. I meet the the uh, national secretary, and uh, she tells me that Bobby Seale will catch, catch up with me in a couple of days. And so I'm staying with Landon and Randy. I'm staying with Tommy Jones. Mm -hmm. But Robert Bay takes me to his house to meet Landon and Randy Williams, who are also captains. Uh, they are Vietnam Special Forces veterans. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, the first thing that they start wanting to show me was their weaponry. Mm -hmm. And they each have their own armament in their rooms, and they have uh, bullet-loading equipment. And, you know, they're showing me their weapons and, you know, their handguns. And, and, uh, and so, you know, it's becoming clear that, hey, I'm, I'm in a serious organization, mm -hmm. you know, with people that are really serious. Mm -hmm about what they're doing. Had you and, handled the weapon yet at that point in your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, growing up, we all had BB guns, mm -hmm. and we all had, and we had 22s, mm -hmm. and we had, went hunting with 22s. So, um, yeah, yeah, and I had handled a weapon at Voodoo Man's house. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it wasn't, and, and we had friends that, who, uh, white friends who did a lot of hunting and so they uh, they had always had gun racks at their house, and so um, yeah, guns were, were not foreign okay. at all yeah. uh, to to me or us. So um, <clears throat> um, so I'm you know I I go to visit Huey in Prit in jail. That's mm -hmm. one of the orders. One of the things I have to do is visit him. I go out and sell papers with some Black Panther Party members. <laughs> And then I spent some time with Bobby Seale traveling from Merritt College to 
I was meeting with BSU members, and then we end up in San Francisco at a central committee meeting. And uh, at that meeting is uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael, um, um, Don Cox, the field marshal of the Black Panther Party, um, David Hilliard, the national captain, uh, and 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 um, some other people, um, some other captains, Black Panther, and these these guys are all you know older guys. And so uh, I'm introduced as a new captain, and um, and then uh, the next day I'm with Robert Bay Landon and Randy and. You know, we're at their house, we're drinking some, what is called uh, Bitter Dog, which was a street drink, which is dark port wine. Pour a little bit out and you put some lemon juice in there, you shake it out, it's a pretty potent drink. And later became known as Panther Piss. It was dubbed a Panther Piss, so we're drinking that. And we're smoking some Brother Rugi, which is the code name for marijuana. And uh, Landon, didn't drink or smoke weed, so he's in the front room watching TV. So I'm getting it, feeling a little more comfortable, and you know, loosening up and everything. And um, and uh, suddenly we hear a loud bang, and we run into the living room, and Landon is there with his 44 Magnum in his hand. And Robert Bay says, "Man, what'd you do, man? Why'd you shoot the TV out?" He said, "I was tired of watching the Cowboys and Indians, and the Indians always getting killed." I shot the TV out. So um, later on, right after that, we go down to Seventh Street in West Oakland. We uh, we uh, get something to eat, and uh, me and another young Panther named Orlando Harris, who was in Sacramento uh, when they went uh, when they took the armed delegation. He's only 16 years old. I think he was 15 when they went to Sacramento, and he's very prominent in that film, holding a M1 carbine with a toothpick in his mouth. Uh, so me and him go out, and you know we're smoking cigarettes, and a car drives by, police car. We start. He starts yelling at it, "Pig, you damn pig! You better stop at that stop." They start cussing at the pig, and he's just going off. So I join in, and I'm I'm doing it too. And this is only uh, maybe two weeks after little Bobby Hutton had been mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of tension, a mm -hmm. lot of tension between the police department and the Black Panther Party. And uh, pretty soon the police goes around, he comes back and he calls for reinforcements. More police start driving up on the scene. Then Robert Bay, Landon and Randy come out and Tommy Jones, they come out. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, people are, are, are actually running home and closing their stores and saying, I'm getting out of here, it's going to be a shootout. People are leaving. And this is the same corner that Huey Newton had his shootout where he was wounded and two policemen were, one was killed, one was wounded. The same corner, 7th and Wood. So people are running, there's going to be, and people, pretty soon the street is deserted almost and the prostitutes are the only ones that are there. They're saying they're going to stay here and help see what happens to uh, the Panthers. And um, I just remember Robert Bay comes down, he says, spread out. You know, he says, spread out in this deep voice. So uh, we all spread out. The police are all bunched together. The police have their hands on, our, on their guns. Spread um, out so it's not to give them a, a bunched up target. Right, yeah. exactly, yeah. right. So we spread out. Mm -hmm. Police, they don't spread out. They're all bunched up. They're showing a lot more fear than we are. Mm -hmm. They got their hands on their guns. We have our hands on our guns. I had just been given a 9mm uh, automatic uh, 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 the day before, and so we're all armed. Um, and I remember seeing, um, oh, pretty soon the street's deserted. So I'm thinking, oh shit, man, damn, what have I got myself into, you know? Damn. Um, so I see this young black guy, he's got a bag of groceries, and I'm saying to myself, I wish he would stay here and help us. And our eyes meet, and he looks at me and he says, man, I will stay here and help you, but I got to get home. And then he's gone. And so now uh, the police, there's a lieutenant out front of the police, and he's looking at Landon, because Landon's out front of, in, of us, and he's 
got his hand on his gun. He said, I'm going to search you. And Landon says, no, you're not going to search me. And Landon, he starts walking towards Landon, and Landon starts backing up. And I'm thinking, shit, Landon shot that TV out. Shit, you know, no telling what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this this went on for a few seconds, you know, and it just, it was so much tension, you could have cut it, as cliche as, as it sounds. Uh, but suddenly Landon tripped over a garbage can top. He bounces right back up, but the garbage, you can hear the garbage can top reverberating. And that just like cuts the tension. Because the next thing, the police turn around. They don't say a word. They turn around, they get in their cars, and they drive off. So this was a victory for us. You know, this, we, we stood our ground. And uh, they chose that this was not a night that they wanted to engage mm -hmm. with us. And so uh, we gave our guns to the prostitutes because we figured they were going to come back with more reinforcements. And then finally we left and go home. Mm -hmm. So that was my baptism into the Black Panther Party wow. that night. Yeah. And so the very next day they have the uh, Saturday Panther meeting that they have every week at the uh, St. Augustine's Church. And so Panthers are coming from uh, all over the Bay Area, San Mateo, uh, San Jose, um, Richmond, Vallejo, and everywhere. It's about 125 people in there, you know, men and women. You know, most people have their uniforms on. And it's just electrifying. And Bobby Seale gets up and he talks. And he talks about the 10-point program, how we got to know the 10-point program and recite it. And he introduces me, and I'm introduced as the first captain of the uh, Seattle chapter, first office outside the state of California. And uh, <coughs> so after the meeting, you know, everybody's greeting me, and, you know, I feel really like, you know, this is my new family. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I leave with Robert Bay and Tommy Jones. We go back to the house. And when we get to the house, uh, the phone rings. Robert Bay runs and grabs the answer to the phone. He says, yeah. He slams the phone down. He runs to his room. He grabs two rifles. He hands me one and a box of ammo. <coughs> and he says, they're vamping on the cameras at the church. So we jump in his car, and he's speeding, going about 50, 60 miles an hour down Grove Street. And he asked me if I know how to load the weapon. Mm. And I said, yeah. I mean, I'd never seen that 40. It was a 44 Magnum carbine, but I, I figured out how to load it. You know, So I load it, and I'm saying, damn, here we go again. So we get down to the church, uh, there's nobody there. And so um, I don't know what happened or what the call was, but, or if they left, but nobody's there. So, you know, we're, we're relieved that nobody's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So we're going back. The next day I'm on a flight back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So I know what it is about to be in the Black Panther Party. And, uh, you know, um, and so I began, you know, we began organizing <coughs> the Seattle chapter, and we opened up our first office and get our phones in and <coughs> take over 300 applications in a, over a month period of time of people wanting to join the Black Panther Party. And uh, <coughs> I was going to say, I mean, they had the, like the hot adrenaline of these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that was that was just the beginning. And that, and that was just getting started. That was just the <laughs> beginning, you know. Yeah. That was, oh, my God. So anyway, uh, you know, we open up our office. We, you know, we got all these young people and older people, Vietnam vets that are joining, everybody, and we're carrying our guns around we're, because it's not illegal to carry a gun down the street. So we're carrying our rifles, our shotguns, with us everywhere we get, went, go, every up and down the street, in the cars, and, mm -hmm. and these everything. are all legally acquired guns. They're, they're legally yeah. acquired. Well, I won't, I won't say they're all legally acquired. Uh, they definitely weren't all legally acquired, but they were legal guns. They weren't automatic weapons. Okay. So you know, and, and, there's, you, and did the police ever hassle you over? Oh them? yeah, we we we're having confrontations continuously. You know, it's continuous confrontations, and. Um, we started getting calls from the community, and we start getting domestic violent calls, landlord disputes, problems with the police, and uh, you know we're trying to answer these calls, and uh, you know 
the domestic violence calls, we will send some armed panthers over there and they would, you know, stop that domestic violence that's mm -hmm. going on. And mm -hmm. uh, it was it was really empowering. And uh, for the first time, the community had somebody they could call, you know, for, for all kinds of problems. And for the first time, they could just pick the phone up and say, you know, hey, I got this problem, I got that problem. Will you send some people over here to help you, help me? You know, we, there was an incident where... In America, we're taught that that's supposed to be the police. But yeah, was that, right. Was that not the case? In, oh, oh, no, it wasn't the case in Seattle or anywhere else, you know. Um, so uh, we now were filling that role. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a landlord uh, incident where the landlord had taken the door off of the hinges of a woman who had seven kids. And we sent some panthers to the house, and they got the... Uh, door and carried it down the street and uh, put it back on, on the woman's, uh, on the hinges. <laughs> um, so we started getting calls from this high school. I had uh, was sending in weekly reports to Bobby Seal and we talked on the phone. He told me, he said, Dixon, you guys are going out on too many of these community <laughs> calls because <coughs> the community likes to take advantage of you. So I want you to, you know, you know, Cut back on that. What was your response to that? Uh, right on. Right on, Chairman. Right on, Chairman Bobby. You know, because, uh, you know, we, you had to follow orders in all your actions. That's mm -hmm. one of, That was one of the models of the Black Panther Party, follow mm -hmm. orders in all your actions. Now, were you all doing your, your reading assignments? Yeah, political education that? class. We were having our Red Book. You know, we, we studied the Red Book. Mm -hmm. Um, Chairman Miles read books because it had a lot of things in there that were just basic common things, you know, the, the three models and seven rules and just, you know, like you don't take anything from the people of the masses, you return everything you mm -hmm. borrow, you know, you fight against liberalism, uh, uh, criticism, constructive criticism and self-criticism and just all very basic things to help us you know, with the day-to-day -day struggles and uh, between ourselves and what we had to do, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, our political education class where we were, you know, usually read out of the newspaper and discussed things that was in the Black Panther newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party is spreading all across the country uh, around this time, and, and the L.A. chapter is, is, is really catching a lot of, you know, three Panthers are killed in L.A. in the summer of, of, of 68. Um, <clears throat> so, um... You're reading some pretty heavy stuff. And how did... How did yeah, that France Fanon, right? Wretched of the Earth, Black yeah. Skin, White Mask, uh, Black Rage, and, and other things. I mean, you know, even before that, we were already reading uh, in uh, heavy stuff. You know, in college and even in high school, we are because there was a lot of black writers who were writing a lot of, there was James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. We always read a lot of James Baldwin, Richard Wright, mm -hmm. and, and many, many others. You know, we, were, we, we, we really read a lot. Even before we got in the party, we were reading all these books. But the, the folks that were, being, that were applying to, for membership and that were joining you mm -hmm. all, were they... Were they down with with this kind of reading, or you know, this is the whole thing with like yeah. the lumpen proletariat. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah. Are the lumpen ready to read? Well, this yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. people had to attend political education class. People had to get the books, and you know, Bobby Hutton didn't know how to read or write before mm -hmm. he joined the party. And by the time he's seventeen, he knows how to read and he knows how to write because he's reading these things. You know that that he has to read, and and comrades help him with that as well. So, um, and then we started getting a lot of college educated college students that began to join the Black mm -hmm. Transport. So you got a combination of the lump and proletariat and you got all these college students that are coming in as well. Um, so um, uh, it, it was a good combination of the two, you know, coming together. Um, so, um, so we started getting calls from this woman on Monday that her son was going to an all-white high school. He got beat up and the principal wouldn't do anything about it. So I explained to her we couldn't come out there. So she called back on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Sorry, ma'am, we can't come. She called back on Friday. She was crying. Towards the end of the school year, white students had bought 
bats and chains to school. They were beating the kids and threatening the kids, and nobody would do anything about it. And so we got another call from another mother, same thing. And so uh, it, when we got that last call, there were about 13 Panthers in the office, and everybody had their rifle and shotgun. So I said, okay, let's go. We're going to go. So we get out there. There's 25 policemen there on the side of the building. They're already there. Already there. So they knew you were coming? Well, they probably might have been called out there because of the disturbance, mm -hmm. because of what was going on. Which high school? <laughs> Rainier Beach. <coughs> By this time, school is already out. So uh, we cross the street. Uh, one of the sergeants says, uh, Dixon, you can't take those loaded weapons into the school. They all know you at this point. Yeah, they, they, know, they know me. They know, you know the other comrades. And so knowing the gun laws, and the gun law states that if a bullet is not in the chamber mm -hmm. and you're carrying it, then it is concealed, considered unloaded. Mm -hmm. So I'd say they're not, they're not loaded. So we go right into the office, uh, into the school. We see the principal. He sees us. He takes off running. We go back. And so I, we get somebody. They go get him, and they escort him and sit him down. And, we, and I tell him, you know, if you don't start protecting these kids, we're going to protect them. And he hmm. is vi visibly shaken, and he promises that from now on he will protect them. And so we leave, we back our way across the street. We don't turn our backs to the police because that's one of the things Huey told me when I went mm -hmm. to visit him, don't turn your back to the pigs. So we get in our cars and we drive back. They follow us back, but they don't stop us. Uh, and they're trying to come up with some kind of indictment against us, but we didn't do anything illegal. Because right. there's no, no law at that time against bringing rifle and shotguns into the school. So that was the first major incident that really marked the emergence of the Seattle chapter. <coughs> We're going. Okay. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened. I mean, I can't tell you everything. Um, you know, I would just say, would say that we had some, there was some prop people who had joined the party for their own personal reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, you know, there were elements that were starting to do robbing banks and robbing stores that were connected to the party. And, uh, you know, the same thing happened, started happening in Oakland because a lot of these people, we didn't really have a way of providing income for people. And so a lot of people, but in, in the Bay Area, that's what a lot of people did. But they started, re people who were from the Lumpen, they started reverting back to their old mm -hmm. tactics and the fact that they had a uniform on and a gun. Because when you give young men a gun and you put a uniform on, they do crazy things. Mm -hmm. And this was starting to happen uh, within the party. Now, would you try to control that? And just well, um, we had, what, what uh, Huey did was he, from prison, he uh, gave an order that we had to have a purge. So we, we began to expel these people from the party, mm -hmm. you know. In, in Oakland, they had a big purge in the Bay Area. In, in Seattle, we had a big purge here as too. And it really almost destroyed the party. There were two people that lost their lives behind this activity that was taking place. Uh, it really damaged our credibility in the media, mm -hmm. I mean, in the community. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, uh, you know, p even people left because of that, so. I know, particularly in Seattle, there were uh, bombing incidents, right, fire bombs. Yeah, well, that was, that was separate. That was, that was separate. separate from incident. Yeah, that was separate because in uh, July, after I returned from New York with Bobby Seale and Eldridge Cleaver and Emory Douglas, we went to the U.N. Uh, for the purpose of getting the U.N. to... Um, intervene in the trial of Huey P. Newton and intervene on the genocidal practices of the U.S. against the black community. And so it was a whole plan that the party had developed uh, by going into the U.N. and having Black Panther Party members standing uh, with free Huey flags at behind every flag of the nation, mm -hmm. of the United Nations, and we were going to go in with a delegation of James Foreman, Stokely Carmichael, myself, and so on. But when we got to the SNCC office and had the meeting with James Foreman and Stokely Carmichael, it ended up into a big argument, hmm. uh, and almost a fist fight. 
and uh, we stormed out of the office, and the coalition between SNCC and the Black Panther Party was dead at that, that point. That was it. And James Foreman was the one that was supposed to get us into the UN. So we had to find somebody else. And we found this woman, Mae Mallory, who was one of the leaders, uh, founders of the Black mm -hmm. Power Movement. And so we got a small audience with the Tanzania delegation. Okay. Uh, when this, this was um, June, uh, this is June of 68. Okay. I'm just trying to think in terms of when um, Foreman gets the Black Manifesto, which would have been right around that same time. Right? Yeah, it, it probably yeah. was. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it was a power struggle, mm -hmm. you know, because James Foreman, you know, he was, had been around longer and he felt mm -hmm. that, you know, because he had brought some of his field marshals up there to the meeting. I mean, not to the meeting, but to be in the SNCC office mm -hmm. while we were there. And I just remember them not being very friendly mm -hmm. and some tension going on there. So, um, you know, I come back to Seattle, um, and uh, only a week after I've been in Seattle, the, uh, I'm on my way to the office, and I see police cars in front of the office and I, I started to turn around. I said, no, let me go find out what's going on. I go down there and they ask me, are you Aaron Dixon? I said, yeah, they, you're under arrest. So I was arrested along with Curtis Harris uh, and charged with, um, um, charged with um, stealing a typewriter. Now Curtis Harris was the one that had been organizing these illegal activities and we didn't know what was going on at the time. Uh, and then he later on would become suspected as being a police informant mm -hmm. because I was arrested. We were both arrested and he was released. And um, they had a rally down at Garfield because the community heard about what happened. So the party organized a big rally at Garfield High School. And they marched down to the um, jail and, you know, demanded my freedom. They marched back to Garfield and it erupted into a, a a riot, a major riot. It was Seattle's first major riot, and it lasted for three days. Um, and so there was a lot of firebombing and turning over police cars. At midnight, they decided to let me go. Um, so they let me go at midnight. I'm picked up by some uh, Panthers. Did they think that that might? Calm yeah, things down? I thought they thought it would calm things down. So, but it, by I get out at midnight, they're still rioting down at Garfield, and they got the streets all blocked off and mm -hmm. helicopter flying. And so I get to my mother's house, and there's some Panthers there. It's about eight, ten, twelve Panthers. Everybody's got their rifles and guns, and they want to go down to Garfield and you know engage the enemy. And so you know they're trying to convince me, and so you know I give in and say, okay, yeah, let's let's go ahead and go down there. So we try to make it down there on foot. Helicopter spots us uh, and shines a light on us. One of the Panthers shoots the light out. And uh, pretty soon we know that the area is going to be surrounded by police. There's somebody out there who we know, uh, his, he, he calls us into his house. <coughs> and just as we got into his house, the area is surrounded by police. And so this kind of really ticks off kicks off a war between the Black Panther Party and the Seattle Police Department. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so we go on a campaign of sniping and firebombing. And, uh, um, you know, we're sniping at the police, uh, and uh, pretty soon the uh, Madrona Hill, we call it Pork Chop, it gets the name of Pork Chop Hill, which is a Korean battle in Korea. Mm -hmm. And um, Police at night, they don't come up there unless they're three cars deep and, and with their, and four men in a car and their rifle shotguns hanging out the window. This is how tense it's gotten. And so this goes on all through that whole summer of 68, you know, and, and, and all across the country, you know, you got mm -hmm. people shooting at police, you got riots, you got people attacking police stations, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the revolution had come that summer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, did, they, did the police ever reach out and try and negotiate with you, or you know, in a, in a through a, a more peaceful way, or was it just this no, no, that was no, that time. wasn't going to happen because we weren't going to sit down and negotiate no. with them. Okay, uh, but the the, the uh, Seattle Metro did send a 
delegation up to um, to meet with us because where our office was, that's where the bus parked right in front of it. And so when we opened up our office, we told the bus driver, you can't park there. You got to park back there. And uh, one day we were having a meeting and a uh, uh, bus driver decided to test us. He parked in front of us while we were having a political education meeting. And uh, Elmer and another Panther went on the bus and, uh, you know, jumped on the bus driver, took his phone out and threw it on top of the roof. And uh, I got charged with, the, with that charge. <laughs> And so they had a warrant out for me, and mm -hmm. uh, so I had to go down and turn myself in. But the black judge, we had a black judge, and he let me off. Uh, but they did send a delegation down to meet with us to try to negotiate about letting them park their bus there. The and bus we told them, no, right. uh, not while we're here. Yeah. And, uh, Is that because you needed sight lines out? Yeah, yeah, yeah we needed, uh, we didn't want our office blocked up because we had painted Black Panther Party on there and Panthers on there, had all the posters on our windows and everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we survived that summer of 68 and then the fall, you know, first Panther is killed by the Seattle Police Department, uh, Welton Armstead, 17 years old. Um, what was the circumstances there? Uh, he was uh, at home you know, he was sort of like an underground uh, in that he wasn't a full-time panther, but he bought money by and he bought guns by. He would steal guns, to, you know, get money. He was a hustler, but he was still a panther. Lumping, he was a lumping proletariat, you know. So anyway, he I guess the police were out looking for him. He's at home at his mother's apartment, at his him and his mother's apartment, and up on the third floor. He looks out the window, he sees the police there confronting his mother and bothering his mm. mother. He grabs his rifle, he runs downstairs, and uh, he gets involved, and uh, they shoot him. But they shoot him in the back. They shoot him in the back. And uh, that was our first uh, casualty. And uh, there was another casualty in December, uh, which came about because he was given an order by somebody to go rob a, a grocery store and the grocery store owner killed him. Um, so that's when we started getting hit to you know, that something else is going on mm -hmm. that, that we don't know about. Uh, and so then my trial starts uh, in December. Uh, I have really a good lawyer, this lawyer um, who eventually became a federal Supreme Court judge here in the state of Washington. Um, <coughs> um, he was considered at the time to be one of the finest lawyers in the state of Washington. He comes and volunteers to take my case because what had happened was when we were trying to get all our things that we needed for our office, typewriters, desk, and all those things, you know, there was an informant that came into the party. So this guy says, uh, hey, man, so-and-so's going to give us a typewriter at, down at the Model Cities. He said, we can come down there after five. All we got to do is go in there and get it. He'll leave the door open for us. So I said, okay, let's go on down there. And I was excited. Yeah, we're going to get a brand new typewriter. <coughs> Excuse me. So I carried it out. I carried it out of there, and I carried it into the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, a block away with plainclothes detectives. Uh, watching me carry it into the office. The whole thing was a setup. Thing was a setup. Mm -hmm. So when the trial comes, uh, um, they um, there's a secret witness that they adjourn the uh, the hearing to wait for the secret witness. So everybody's waiting for the secret witness. Who is going? Who's going to be the secret mm -hmm. witness? And he never shows up. So I'm found not guilty. <coughs> <coughs> found not guilty. So. Um, so anyway, I end up going, uh, we end up having a purge. We get rid of a lot of people, and then we start the Breakfast for School Children program. And there were people who didn't think that was revolutionary, serving breakfast for school children. We opened up our first breakfast program um, at uh, Madrona Presbyterian Church. That was, in, uh, six, that was in the winter of 69. Yeah, well, can I ask about the philosophy mm -hmm. there? Who's that? So yeah, uh, just 
the sort of com maybe two competing camps, uh, continuing the armed revolution or meeting basic needs mm -hmm. um, in the black yeah. community. Can yeah. you talk about, a little bit about yeah. how that conversation was happening <coughs> in yeah. the party? Yeah. Uh, are we, we ready? Yeah, we're Okay. Yeah. And this was a, a, always, this, you know, this was the, the dual nature of the Black Panther Party, is that there were elements in the party that believed in armed guerrilla warfare, mm -hmm. and they wanted to go do that. And Eldridge Cleaver was the chief proponent of that. Mm -hmm. He is the one that caused that incident where little Bobby Hutton was killed. And so there were, you know, people in the party who related to personalities. There were people who loved the personality of Huey. There were people who loved the personality of, of Bobby Seale, and there were people who loved the personality of Eldridge. And so they were willing to, uh, they thought that this was the way that we should be going. So, but anyway, Eldridge has to go into exile, you know, and I think by 1970 he goes into exile. And he goes from Cuba, and then he eventually is living in Algeria, where we're, the Black Panther Party is given diplomatic status, mm -hmm. and as well as a diplomatic compound. And so, um, uh, so um, you know, and, and but this is still, even though he's not in the country, there's still, it's still a continuing struggle in the party of, of, of you know, community programs. So we go on and start uh, many more community programs than the Weatherman Underground takes off. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the East Coast Panthers. Uh, and Bobby Seale is one of the, those who's a real proponent of a program. community program, right. yeah, yeah, right. definitely. Right. And you're yeah, okay. and then uh, so I go down to uh, Oakland in '69. Bobby, Seale, I go down there, and things aren't going well in Seattle. Bobby Seale tells me to stay down there, and so I stay down there, and I'm, you know, I go back down with my family, and I'm, you know, getting training because this is what they instituted after I had become captain. Mm. was the new chapters and branches. They, people had to come to Oakland and stay there for a while. But that didn't happen with me because we were a new chapter. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm going through my kind of panther training. So you're living in Oakland. I'm living What's in Oakland. What's happening back up here in Seattle? While you're uh, Elmer, is, Elmer is running things. Okay. And we had already started the purge. Mm. Before I went down there, we had already purged uh, Curtis Harris and a whole bunch of other people. And so um, and I told Elmer to just get rid of the rest. And so, um, now, did, the, that, did that ever come back on you? Any of the the purges of those people? I imagine people weren't happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that. no, no, it, no, no. It did. It didn't. It didn't come back, and not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, they were. My, my brother got threatened at Garfield High School. Some of them came up there with guns and threatened him. Hmm. So, um, um, but you know, they knew not to not to really mess with us, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so while I'm down in Oakland, Bobby Seale gets kidnapped by the FBI, and he's taken, driven to Chicago by a car. Nobody knows where he's at. And he goes to the whole Chicago trial. Mm -hmm. They gag him, they chair, chain him down to the chair, and, um, and so David Hillier takes over the leadership of the party. So Eldris is in exile, Huey's in prison, Bobby's now in jail, yeah. um, and so the party is under attack. The FBI, a, a, J. Edgar Hoover, they, they said that uh, amongst themselves they were going to have us eliminated by 1969. So in January of, um, of 1969, Bunchy Carter and Elders, uh, uh, John Huggins, the two leaders of the Southern California chapter, are assassinated. Um, Eleven months later, uh, Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. head of the Chicago chapter, is assassinated. Uh, Diego Hoover had sent out a memo uh, that he wanted two chap three chapters destroyed: Chicago, L.A., and Seattle. So when I when Bobby is uh, kidnapped uh, and gone to jail, I'm sent back to Seattle because okay. we've got to start this campaign to try to free Seattle. So we, me and my brother, we start organizing, we organize in the Seattle chapter. We, we get orders to close down the storefronts and move into a community, move into a house in the community. So we find a duplex and we uh, open up a community center in the duplex. <clears throat> we start fortifying our office with sandbags. Because we meet with this, this guy from the Justice Department, a black man, says that he wants to meet with us. 
We don't want to meet with him. We put it off. We put it off. Finally, he says it's a matter of life and death. So we meet with him. Uh, he tells us that, you know, they're going to come in and kill us, that they're going to raid us and kill us. So we start fortifying our office with sandbags and double sandbags and steel fortifications on the doors and on the windows. Is he, is he threatening you or is he No, he's not threatening me. He's tipping us off. And why, why is, do you, what, what was motivating him, do you think? Well, because he's black okay. <laughs> and he's from Seattle and he... You know, he, he, you know, he, he tells us they're coming to kill you guys. Okay, so you he know? really did tip you off. Yeah, he really did tip us off. And so we start preparing. Um, and, and we had already gotten orders anyway to fortify our offices. So all the Panther chapters all across the country are fortifying their offices with sandbags and bunkers and all kinds of things. And so my brother and I, we, we're still students at the UW, uh, technically, and we get our last financial aid checks, $1,700 each. We spend our whole checks, that whole, all that money went on guns, ammunition, uh, gas masks, uh, flak jackets, and things to fortify our office, things to protect us. And that was the most important thing, is that we're going we're gonna to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. But we had also started creating the breakfast program and expanding the breakfast program to five breakfast program locations in Seattle. And and Black Panther Party all across the country is expanding these survival mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. You know, and we started the first free medical clinic in Seattle. The party opens up eleven medical clinics all across the country. And in some places they start a free ambulance program. We start the first food bank program. You know, which is now a nationwide program in the state of Washington. It's a statewide program. Black Panther Party started the first food bank program, which is a staple now, the way that people survive yeah. in, our, in our clinics. And so we're in a free legal aid program. We started a free legal aid program. We started the busing the prisons program. Somebody gives us a 35-passenger bus to use to go to all the prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're, you know, we... How are you able to fund these programs? Where's we the get orders. Uh, that every panther has to sell a hundred papers a day, mm. so we're selling. So we got a lot of uh, some of the funds came from the newspapers, but we had somebody who was a, a breakfast program coordinator, the medical clinic coordinator, the uh, liberation school coordinator, and they had to go out and hustle. They had to go out and get money for their programs and get resources for their programs. Then there's wealthy people who uh, liberal who are donating money and. That we got a lot of money that was donated from Japanese, older Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why at the time, but I learned about the internment program. Mm -hmm. and that's why uh, that they were contributing to us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, now, in your personal, what's going on in your personal life right now? Are you still single? or? Oh, I had become married uh, in 68. I got married. Mm -hmm. My son was born in 69. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I got a little family going on. So does that change things for you? At no, all? because my wife is in the party as well. Okay. So, um, you know, it's it's just, uh, you know, we're all just moving forward, you know. And, and, you know, like you said early on that, you know, you're going from these highs and lows. Well, it, we're really going through highs and lows now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we're really going. It's just like everything is moving. We, so, um, you know, we, we got to sell papers every day. Everybody has to go out in the field and sell papers every day. Uh, then uh, we have, um, um, you know, the breakfast program. We got to get up early in the morning and go to the breakfast program. You know, we're running the, all these programs and no government funding is coming in. And, um, but it's really a great time, you know, because, you know, we're so energized. We're young. We got a lot of energy in. We're able to do all these things, and, 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 and we're fearless. We're not afraid of anything, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so it's just like 20 of us, 25 of us, compared to 200 of us, and we're doing so much work. Mm -hmm. And not only do we have to do all this work, but we, you know, when we come in from the field, we, have, we all eat together communally, and we have political education class, we have weapon class, then everybody has to pull security two hours a night, 10 to 12, 12 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6. So, um, you know, it's just it's just constant it's thing. Intense lifestyle. <laughs> it's yeah. it's a very intense lifestyle, you know, but, um, but you know, we're, we're, you know, this is what we want, want to do, you know. And so they began, so this attack, you know, the, this attack this guy is talking about, and they start in Chicago. 
They go in there. They kill Fred Hampton. They try. They wanted to kill Bobby Rush, but he wasn't there. Um, and then four or five days later, they go to L.A. and they raid the L.A. office. But the L.A. Panthers are very yep. military minded. They got a bunker built inside. And they have a shootout. They're ready. Yep. It lasts six eight hours, you know. Yep. And the only thing that stopped them is they run out of ammunition, and they surrender. Then the ATF comes to Seattle. They go to Mayor West Oman. The Mayor West Oman says, I'm not going to let you do that. Because he saw what happened in Chicago. He saw what happened in L.A. Seattle's a much smaller place. Everybody knows us. Everybody knows who we are. We, we got, probably is these programs, we got all these programs we're doing. We're tickets, uh, testing for sickle cell anemia. Right, right. And we did the first mass testing of sickle cell anemia in Walla Walla Prison. So, I mean, people are depending upon us. So how is he going to let the ATF come in there and, and try to kill us? So he says no. And so... Um, Have you had any dealings with Wes Oman before, before this? Or no, this? not really. Okay. Not okay. really. Right. But we had, we had continuous attempts to raid our office by the Seattle Police Department. Okay. And there were two policemen that they assigned just to harass us, arrest us. And so, you know, it, it's been a constant battle mm -hmm. just with the Seattle Police Department fighting them, you know. Mm -hmm. and dealing with them and dealing with uh, the issues that they're causing in the community as well. Are there black officers on, in the police? There's there only there? one. There's one. Only one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he does intervene in the behalf of a, of a panther, Leon Valentine Hobbs. Um, so, so, um, and so when Mayor West Oman sticks up, then other... Uh, municipalities start sticking up too and, and not allowing these raids to take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Mayor West Oman goes back to New uh, D.C. for the mayor's convention, he's told he's not welcome and they don't let him in. Oh, really? Yeah. Because <clears throat> Nixon, you know, this is part of Nixon's plan. He wanted, this is what he wanted. You know, I was on Nixon's enemy list. He had an enemy list of 100. I'm sure most of those people were Panthers that were on that enemy list. Uh, Seattle Police Department also put out a contract on my head, a $25,000 contract. This was during the summer of 68 to stop the firebombing because uh, Time Magazine had a chart of cities during the summer of 68. Mm -hmm. They had two charts, the chart of firebombings and the chart of sniping. And Seattle was number one on firebombing uh, compared to Chicago, Detroit, and all the other places. We were number one and that we were number two in sniping. Hmm. So they felt that if, if they got rid of me, that they could uh, end the firebombing, end the firebombing campaign. And the firebombing campaign was really directed at racist establishments, you know, hmm. in and outside of the community. Uh, and, and, you know, it got out of hand because there were some people who weren't necessarily racist establishments that, that did get firebombed. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, that, that was casualties of war, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but... There were targets chosen collectively? Yeah, or were people yeah, we, we, yeah, we chose targets collectively, but there were people who went off and did their own thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and that was unfortunate. <coughs> so, <coughs> this guy, Curtis Harris, this is during the summer of 68, I, I failed to mention this, but um, we got our hands on some dynamite and we left three, two people to watch the dynamite, and we went somewhere and we came back, and they the dynamite was gone. We said, what happened to the dynamite? All oh, the police came in here and took it. So we thought that was strange. They were in police informants. So um, about uh, a couple of days later, these two police informants and Curtis Harris I'm closing the office up one night, and they said, we're going to, Aaron, we're going to walk you home. This is summer of 68 when things are really hot. And I thought that was unusual because they had never volunteered to walk me home before. Mm -hmm. So we're walking. A police yeah, car. Did you usually have security or bodyguards? No, I didn't. I didn't. didn't. I didn't. But there was one brother named Lou Jack who said he he was going to be my bodyguard, and so he was with me quite a bit. There was some. There was a story that... He used to sleep in his car in front of my house. Mm. Uh, but Lou Jack had become part of this other thing that was going on, you know. So anyway, these guys are going to walk me home. 
uh, we get halfway there, a police car drives by, one of them pulls his gun out and shoots at the, fires at the police. And then I look around, they're gone, they disappear. And I knew that I better disappear, so I'm trying to find somewhere to hide frantically, and I run in somebody's backyard, and I run into the backyard, and I said, damn, there's, there's, there's no escape from this backyard because it's got these highway bushes and fence are all the way around. So I hear the police cars driving up, I hear the police talking to themselves, you know, then I hear them running up the stairs t towards where I'm at, and I pull my gun out. And I'm thinking, oh shit, I'm, I'm dead, you know. Um, a man comes out on the porch, I knew the man, I knew his kids, I grew up with his kids. He told his kids not to hang around me and my brother when we joined the party, which I can understand. So he calls me in, I run into his house, and just there's a door closed, the police come into the yard. You know, you know, and we're watching them, they're searching, and they go back out, and they're looking under cars and looking under bushes and everything. And so we wait, and they leave, and then uh, after they left, I run home. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, getting back to uh, what happened with uh, Mayor, Ware, mm -hmm. Mayor Wes Ullman. So it, it also, it, it starts an investigation into not only the activities of the Black Panther Party, but also the response by the FBI. And so because of this investigation, they have to stop those covert raids that they were doing on the Black Panther Party from 68 all the way to 69, where a lot of Panthers were arrested, many charged with, uh, with uh, long, long, many years in prison. Mm -hmm. And so finally that, that kind of stop somewhat, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so then, you know, we're moving forward our programs and um, and then in 70, I think it was about 71, in the fall of 71, uh, me and another comrade, we decided to take our weapons out, all the weapons, we get them all together and put them in a, his step van, and we're going to take them out and test them. Mm -hmm. So we take them all out and we're testing them. We test all the weapons except for the last one, which was a shotgun, a Riot 18 shotgun that I purchased in Oakland. It had a bayonet attachment on it. And I had my own bandolier of shells that I used. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my bandolier oftentimes was in the office, and everybody knew that was my bandolier. So Big Malcolm says, Aaron, this is your weapon. You go ahead and fire it. And we had been smoking some hash on the way there, and so... I uh, put the shoulder uh, shotgun up to my shoulder. Something tells me don't fire it from my shoulder. So I, I bring it down here. I fire from here. As soon as the uh, uh, firing pin hits the primer, it, the gun explodes and you know blows my arm halfway off. You know, that's why I got all this. And I got steel rod and two plates on my arm. And um, you know, I go through about four surgeries. But we had the uh, bullets tested and found out that the gunpowder had been taken out and high explosives had put in, put, put in its place. So it was definitely uh, another assassination attempt. So, but I was back at the office within three days, you know, with my arm in a cast and because we just had too much work to do. You know, so that, if, that, if that gun had been up at oh, shoulder height? Yeah, it would have blew my head, mm. blew my head off. I, I wouldn't be here. So, um, and shortly after that, uh, there's a split between the Black Panther Party. That's when the split happens between, because Huey gets released from prison, and there's a lot of high hopes, and then him and Eldridge get on a, a, you know, a talk show. Right. Yeah. Letters have been sent to Eldridge in Algeria saying Huey wants to kill you. They've been letters sent to Huey saying Eldridge wants to kill you. <coughs> so they were... FBI was fostering already the the strained relationships and the distance that they had between each other, um, and so and and the uh, uh, New York Panthers decide that they they want to take orders from the Weather Underground because they feel that the Underground movement is where it's at. Mm -hmm. Huey expels them from the Black Panther Party, and uh, that leads to the split into the party. 
and so. Uh, and how are you hearing about these things? Where, where's your information? Coming oh, I'm from? getting you know calls from the national headquarters. I'm called down there. Mm -hmm. I get called down there, <coughs> where and other Panther officials from all across the country are called down to Oakland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you know, we're told about the situation, and they want to see whose side everybody is on. Right. <coughs> and um, you know, most of New Jersey and New York go with Eldridge, and mm -hmm. just about everybody else, except, except for the San Francisco. A lot of some of the San Francisco Panthers, who are real close to Eldridge, they go with Eldridge, and uh, the Berkeley Panthers, they go with Eldridge as well. And so now, you know, we're, you know, we're fighting each other, you know, on the streets and people get killed and um, and Huey decides not to have this thing get escalated anymore. You know, he could have sent, he could have given the order and we could have had an all-out war. Right. Uh, but uh, Huey says, no, you know, that's, we're, we're not going to go that way. So, um, decide to, uh, um, that Oakland is going to be a base of operations, that we need to have a base and we need to strengthen that base. And so as a centralization campaign is started, Panthers are brought from all over the country to Oakland to be stationed in Oakland. Um, Elmer had gone to jail, to prison in Oregon for um, um, uh, armed robbery of a leather coat. So when the centralization takes place, you know, he's, uh, he's locked up. So we leave a skeleton crew of people in Seattle, and uh, before that, before we went down to Oakland, we had led a campaign to get Elmer free. We actually got the governor to pardon him. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first time and only time that that happened, that that our governor was going to pardon a Black Panther Party member. <coughs> but my, myself and my father and my attorneys, we met with the governor, and we got him to, uh, to do this. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a petition drive as well. So, um, so we all come down to Oakland. There's people there from all over the country. You come down with um, your family. I come down with my, my wife and my son, and uh, you know, it must have been about ten to fifteen of us. And we, oh man, we had so were so well established in Seattle. Um, you know, it was, but Elmer was able to come out and recruit new people and. They were able to keep the clinic going and expand the clinic and expand the programs and really keep things going. Uh, and in Oakland, we decided we we're going to enter the elect electoral process. Right. You know, the first thing we did is uh, support Shirley Chisholm's campaign for president, and we began our organizing our own campaign to run Bobby Sue for mayor of Oakland, Lane Brown for city council. Open up five campaign offices. It's a masterful campaign. Uh, uh, we give away 10,000 bags of groceries with the chicken in every bag as to kick off the uh, campaign at the Oakland Auditorium. And I just remember, just, just I remember seeing the bags, uh, 10,000 empty bags on the floor of the Oakland Auditorium, you know, and how we were able to, you know, make this thing happen, you know, put the chickens in and the eggs in and the potatoes in and the canned food, loaf of bread, and give it out so that the chicken is still frozen the very next day, you know. And uh, it was it was just a beautiful campaign. I was uh, confined to the office as officer of the day. Uh, I thought I was going to get a high level position in the campaign, but I didn't. Huey really was trying to get rid of me. He had gotten rid of other people, and he he was trying to get rid of me. People would ask me, asked if I'd be included in the security squad that Huey had set up. He had chosen people from different places to be in this security squad, and uh, there were people that felt that I should be in, but Huey would always say no. Um, so, um, <clears throat> what do you think was going on there? Uh, he 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 thought I had too much power. He, I, I was a threat. He thought I was a threat to him, mm. you know, because he felt that, um, you know, well, he told somebody that uh, uh, a lot of people had a lot of respect for me in the in the party, and so he was doing that with with uh, some really good people. He he ran off a lot of really good people, mm. 
And so eventually we ran, you know, we ran Bobby's campaign. Uh, it was a masterful campaign. We didn't win, but we came really close. And so uh, other politicians started coming to us because they saw we had a political machine. We could mm -hmm. get out to vote. Mm -hmm. We really did. We put 350 people out on the street every day to, uh, to get people, to register people to vote. You know, and, and the campaign, we put, you know, four or five hundred people out on the street. We took people out of their homes to the polling places. Mm -hmm. So we did truly have a political campaign. Now, were black folks registered or, or voting in these days? No, they, they weren't. They were, we met so many people that never never voted before in Oakland, you know, old people. Never, never voted, never even registered to vote. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important piece, you know, to get these people registered and get them involved in the campaign. Mm -hmm. And Did you um, do specific things on voting day to make sure that people got. Yeah, involved? we went. We had people standing on corners and freeway overpasses. We had vans going to people's homes, taking people from their homes to the polling places. Mm -hmm. So we were very much active that whole day. You know, that whole day. So. Um, now, in terms of you know, I don't know how much. <coughs> more back. Yeah, I'm just. Curious about how much I don't know how much you're thinking these things through, but you know, from armed revolution to actually using you know the political system. Mm -hmm. So now this is a different kind of tactic. Right? Yeah, well, see, that was the the beauty of, about the Black Panther Party is that we were netted, never wedded to one mm -hmm. tactic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because we read a lot, we understood that nothing stood outside of change. That we always had to be adaptable, mm -hmm. and we always had to be changing. You know, that's why we went from you know, the armed revolution to the breakfast program, the survival programs, mm -hmm. and doing all these programs, and then to the electoral politics. We were constantly evolving and constantly changing our tactics um, to achieve, you know, what we were trying to achieve. Um, and so, um, and you know, there was always people on the left who always criticized us for, first of all, having the broad coalitions that we had with all the different people. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know with the brown berets, the red guard, the aim, uh, the white, uh, the, the the young patriots, and and SDS, a uh, peace and freedom party, and then now the survival program. You know, you know most revolutionary organizations at that time, they didn't think about doing those survival programs. You know, feeding kids, and you know they didn't think that was revolutionary, but it was very revolutionary. Absolutely. And so then we went from there, then we went to the electoral politics, you know, and it just made perfect sense that, uh, you know, we would try to take over the whole electoral piece of Oakland. That, that was our goal, to make Oakland a base of our operations and expand from there. Right. It's about changing the system, so yeah. from without or from within. Yeah, without right. Or and, and we're, yeah, and we could do it with both. But we still had our underground. Mm. We still had a... Uh, this was actually before the split. After the split, the underground caved in because um, there were people who were in the underground who sided with Eldridge, and they no longer had the support from the party. One of those people was Geronimo. He was kind of caught in the middle, mm -hmm. and he had a case, and he and uh, Panthers were allowed to testify in his case, so he goes to prison. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, then Huey becomes, starts snorting cocaine, and um, his whole piece about what he's supposed to be doing and what the party's supposed to be doing really gets distorted, and he, he, he really begins to, you know, become more of a gangster than a revolutionary. Um, so you see that, you see his personality really start to... To yeah, yeah, he's, 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 and cocaine is really changing. Plus, the fact that when he went to prison, the Black Panther Party was just a small organization based in Oakland and in L.A. And now, and, you know, just friends, people he knew, mm -hmm. now he comes out as an international organization. Mm -hmm. He's an international hero. He's almost on the level of Che Guevara, mm -hmm. you know, and he's got access to all this power and money, but he also, there's all these people he doesn't know, and he doesn't trust them, you know? Mm -hmm. And we're already, we're paranoid anyway, we're already paranoid. We're paranoid about the phones, we're paranoid about 
so-and-so were working next to us and who's an informant, who's not an informant. And so then, you know, he comes out and he's paranoid and then he starts snorting cocaine, he becomes even more paranoid. Right. And I think at some point he really didn't realize, he didn't want to, this is not really what he wanted to do. Right. You know, this is not what the role that he envisioned himself doing. He was thrusted up into this role, you know. And so he starts dismantling the party. So uh, anyway, he uh, a contract is put on on his head, a warrant is also put on on his head. You know, he runs off Bobby Seale, John Seale, many other people, and he has to go and flee and go to Cuba and go into exile. And Elaine Brown becomes the chairperson of the Black Panther Party, and so she starts rebuilding the party, and she chooses me as her bodyguard. Can I ask, just as a sort of a sidebar, mm -hmm. about if you could talk about the role of women in the party and, and how yeah. women um, were looked at, were treated, mm -hmm. what, the, what the philosophy of the party was in terms of including women? Yeah. Well, women uh, were considered to be equal in the party. They did everything that the men did, and they weren't confined to doing women's chores. And that, first of all, the type of women that joined the party, they weren't going to go for that anyway. Mm -hmm. They were some very tough, very demanding women. You know, you couldn't pull no crap all over on them. And so they were equal, and, and they served in leadership. The Connecticut chapter was run by a woman, Erica. In the Boston chapter, Captain was a woman, Aud Aud Audrea Jones. Mm -hmm. And so you had Panthers, who women who were on, Elaine Brown, Kathleen Cleaver on the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party. So women had a very prominent, very strong role <coughs> in the party. Now, that doesn't just say that there weren't problems that existed because trying to come, overcome the whole issue of male dominance and machoism and stuff <coughs> uh, was, was very difficult. And there were places, in some places, and even in the Southern California chapter where, uh, where women were abused, you know, uh, in, in many ways. And so that's what Elaine Brown had come out of. <coughs> and now here she was, was the, was the head of the whole Black Panther Party, of what was left of it. So she begins to rebuild the party. And you're on her staff. What's your position? I'm on as her bodyguard. As her bodyguard. Yeah, and she goes to Cuba, and uh, uh, Huey tells to visit her, to visit Huey, and Huey tells her to... Uh, asked Lionel Wilson, a retired Superior Court judge, if he wanted to be mayor. And so we asked him, and he says, yeah. And so we start running a campaign yeah. to run him for mayor. Uh, now, meanwhile... Can I ask a question about sure. you? Did you know Rebecca <coughs> Alexander? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me something about her. She's an old friend. So oh, wow. 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 <laughs> Roberta Alexander, man. Uh... If, if if this is a tall woman, yeah, right? Tall yeah, woman, kind of light complected. Light yeah, person, right? and she uh, worked a, a lot with um, with uh, Big Man, and Big Man was the editor of the newspaper, and they traveled. They did a lot of traveling around the world, you know, uh, talking about the, they they went to uh, Japan. They spent a lot of time in Japan and South Korea and many other places. And she worked on a newspaper too. She was very, you know, very important uh, person, you know, in the party. Yeah. yeah. I ran into her. Yeah. You know, yeah. She's still alive. She's still alive. She's thriving. She has. Where's she at? She's in California somewhere. Wow. I think in Los Angeles or I'll be Los, there. a little south of Los Angeles. Okay. All right. She was. She. She's in. Um, she and my wife went went to dance classes together. Mm. They were roommates in mm. college. And, Wow. Oh, yeah, you told me you ran into her. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, um. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. I'm so glad to hear that she's alive and doing well. Man, damn. So, anyway. Uh, that's not a given, I guess, no. in your world that people are. Survived. Actually, uh, no, it's not. It's not a given, especially some women. Um, um, because they had, they did have a hard time with some things. Uh, but so did a lot of men, you know, and so it, it just wasn't easy, you know, after it was all over. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the story, uh, when we uh, 
before we ran Lionel Wilson's campaign, uh, Jerry Brown came to us and asked us to support his mayor for uh, his bid for governor of the state of California. Yeah. And he had some uh, close relationships with party members in L.A. and Elaine Brown knew him. So we said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll support you. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, work in your campaign. So uh, lo and behold, he becomes the governor. Mm -hmm. And so Elaine is, is spending a lot of time in the governor's office meeting with him and Tony Klein, who was a head legal person in the state of California and then also worked with the party in Southern California. So, um, uh, and Elaine is cultivating this relationship. Um, Jerry Brown calls Elaine up and says, I have six judgeships that I want to fill in, the, in Oakland. Can you help me? She says, yes, I'll give, get, get back with you with the names. She gives them the names of six black attorneys, and they all become judges. Wow. And so you could say that we had some control of the judiciary yeah. in Oakland yeah. because of this. And those lawyers knew why they became uh, judges. It was because of the Black Panther Party. Lane made sure they understood that. So, you know, damn, you know, we got some, we're getting some power here, you mm -hmm. know. So mm -hmm. there, then we start running Lionel Wilson's campaign, and lo and behold, we put the first black mayor into office in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And in return, he's going to appoint two Panther women to the Port of Oakland. And this, the Central Committee is made up of mostly women at this time. Because uh, Elaine, you know, brought women up and, and, and got them in on the Central Committee. And so now we're in Lionel Wilson's office. We're running the city. Oh, the Black Panther Party is running the city. We're meeting with the, uh, the um, damn, what is that person's name? I can't think of his name. But, uh, man, it was, it, was, it was really sad. Plus, we had a private school and a community center. And the private school was one of the best private schools in the country. It started off as a private school just for Panther kids, but it expanded mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. We had people who were doctors and lawyers that had their kids there, as well as kids who came from the housing projects that were students there. Mm -hmm. We had a martial arts program that was uh, on the cover of Black Belt magazine. that had over 100 students. We had um, we started the first gang intervention program in, in the Bay Area. And we got a CETA grant. You know, CETA was a comprehensive employment program. That was one of the best programs the government ever had. Uh, they gave money to nonprofits and businesses to hire people. And so we, we were able to put 20 Panthers on, on the payroll hmm. with, with the big CETA grant that we got. And that's how we started our gang intervention program. And uh, we started uh, a Seniors Against a Fearful Environment program where we got gang members. We hired gang-involved youth to uh, work with seniors on the weekends when they got their paycheck and escort them to the bank, e right. escort them to the grocery store and mm -hmm. so on. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and uh, Elaine was able to clean the image up of the Black Panther Party. We also had a restaurant, and a bar and grill in downtown Oakland called The Lamp Post. We also had um, a, you know, some other businesses. We had a promotion business where we bought Marvin Gaye and Chaka Khan and Earth, mm -hmm. Wind & Fire and other people to Oakland and mm -hmm. Ike and Tina Turner, which didn't turn out to be so <laughs> good. Um, and so, you know, um, and then we had these mi millionaires who all they did was give money to the party. And so we were, had bought a lot of property. We owned a right. lot of property, right. you know, where we had the school was a huge property. And what about your relationship with other groups? <laughs> I was thinking of the, of the nation and, and, you know, the, I know the presence in Oakland and owned property and mm -hmm. had businesses. I mean, the nation of Islam? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a contentious relationship with them because... Huey was um, when he before he went into exile. He was had um, was involved in drug operation, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he had actually told Farrakhan. They had a meeting with Farrakhan that you know, you stay over in San Francisco and we'll deal with Oakland. And now uh, Huey didn't like heroin. He would not allow heroin. He didn't like heroin to be on the streets. Mm -hmm. <coughs> But because uh, cocaine was a casual drug, it was something that 
he had got the party had gotten involved in <coughs> in working with uh different drug dealers and after hour clubs and stuff and also uh making the after hour clubs and the pimps pay the party they mm -hmm. had to pay money that's why he had to go into a cause that's why they put this contract out on because oh, okay. he he had uh in, in, instituted a policy where they had to pay money to the party in order to operate and so he had gotten drug dealers on the yeah. yeah and we had also actually had a, a a movie theater that we were uh got from the uh mafia the mafia owned this uh oakland theater and we were we were putting on uh we we were running it and we were showing movies there <coughs> <coughs> So there's a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> okay. So Oakland, uh, Elaine is becoming like really well known, and and she's yeah. she's the most powerful person in the state of California. You know, Leo McCarthy, the uh, the Speaker of the House for the State Assembly, uh, Willie Brown. You know, I met all these guys. We were down in Sacramento all the time and going to these events with, with these big high guys and mm -hmm. they're just fawning all over Elaine. You know, they, they, one thing they're afraid of her, the other thing they have great respect for. Mm -hmm. Elaine's also culti cultivating relationships with the big corporations, the Shetterly, uh, William Shetterly, head of the uh, mm -hmm. Clorox Corporation or, or, you know, one of those, corp a couple of those corporations. I mean, she could go to these people and say, I need $400,000 for the school and they'll give it to her. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of power. Yeah. Now is the Panther image changing at all? Exterior-wise, mm. I mean, you're still wearing the uniforms. No, we're wearing things? suits, you're man. In suits, we're man. wearing suits. Mm -hmm. You know, this and it's 1969. We stopped wearing. We got orders to stop wearing this, the the Panther uniform because it mm -hmm. separated us from the community and made okay. us targets. So we had already started dressing differently, you know, mm -hmm. in '69. And so, but now, you know, you know, those of us, we're running the school, we've got a private school, we're running all this big nonprofit entity, we've got about four or five different nonprofits, and we, you know, we got these businesses we're running, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, um, you know, and, and Elaine is very much in, 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 you know, the whole image mode, so, you know, people who are around her, you had to be well dressed, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, Elaine becomes president of the Oakland Redevelopment Corporation that wants to redevelop downtown Oakland and, and, and because Oakland has is, is kind of been suppressed. So she's now over all these millions of dollars to de develop Oakland. Mm -hmm. And as part of this, she makes them put it in there that they have to uh, build uh, 1,000 low-income housing units for this redevelopment. But in order to make this happen, they need the freeway to come through Oakland. Mm -hmm. And so she's able to get uh, Jerry Brown to release the funds to build the freeway ramps to come into Oakland. You know, and so, you know, that's okay. And so that, that starts to happen. So Elaine has become a very powerful person in Oakland, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in the state of California. She could get almost anything she wants from these politicians because they're afraid of her for one and and she's extremely intelligent and extreme, extremely bright mm -hmm. so she pays the way for Huey to come back and and stand trial and uh, that was the fatal mistake because our goal was we had taken over Oakland okay so we were going to do the same thing in other parts of the country we we're going to do it in Seattle we we're going to do it in Chicago mm -hmm. We we're going to do it in other places where there are still Black Panther Party networks, and um, and uh, so um, so she pays the way for Huey to come back to stand trial, and he comes back, and you know, first of all, he sees all the power she has, and uh, he wants control of that money she has as well, mm -hmm. and she's she's not giving that up. Mm -hmm. She's not going to do that. And uh, some other things happen. He starts back snorting cocaine again. There was a, a, a drug gang that had been uh, terrorizing one of the ho actually had taken over a housing project near the school. And so uh, we had started a campaign to get rid of this uh, drug gang. 
and uh, these guys had machine guns. They had the whole shebang, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, I think they were getting the heroin from the mafia, but they were very well organized. They even had, were using a computer back then. And so, so we're planning against them. You know, we're, you know, we hit a couple of their safe houses. Or we're organizing community against them, mm -hmm. and um, and this it, is really at the beginning of gangs getting into. Yeah, uh, this was the drugs. beginning, yeah. and yeah. Felix Mitchell, the guy's mm -hmm. name is Felix Mitchell, and this is going to be, this is going to be bloody. This mm -hmm. is going to be a lot of people going to be killed in this, because mm -hmm. uh, they're driving by the uh, school and they're looking at us. They're looking at me and Elaine's car. They're stopping and writing things down, mm -hmm. and we're doing the same to them. And so uh, then Huey comes back. Huey comes back. He wants control of this money. Elaine won't give it to him. He does some other things. He forces Elaine out of the party. Elaine leaves the party. And she takes out a full page ad in the Oakland Tribune. Uh, you know, and she says that she's going to pursue her music career because she has been under contract with Motown because she made several albums while she was in the party. And so, um, and then when she leaves, and uh, so a lot of these very smart women start leaving. Now, is there a relationship to this drug, the story you were starting to tell about the drug gang and the... Yeah, um, with, with yeah. Huey. yeah, yeah, because then Huey comes back, and when Elaine leaves, he meets with these two drug gangs and tells them that in order to operate, that they got to pay the party, you know, twenty five, fifty thousand 50000 a week or a month or something like that. And so they go, they said they're going to think about it. And so we start preparing, you know, to, to go to war with these guys. Um, hmm. And in the, and also, um, Huey, at this point, everything he does is wrong. Everything he does just leads to the quicker decline of the party, you mm -hmm. know. He uh, decides that this woman who is could testify against him in the trial, Elaine already had that under control. She already had gotten somebody to become good friends with this woman and follow her around and become close with her and uh, as to try to find out what she's going to say during the testimony. But Huey decides he wants to have her eliminated. And he sends some people to have her eliminated. I was supposed to be one of those people, but he has me replaced at the last minute. The person he replaces me with when they get to the scene, they accidentally uh, shoot another panther in the back of the head, and everything just falls apart from there. They got to leave this guy's body there. The, and so the next day, the Oakland Tribune panther in blue jumpsuit found with M16, you know, and they find another M16, and it just it just spirals downhill from there. And that 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 really was pretty much the end of the Black Panther Party. The last thing I did, I got orders to, uh, he was trying to cover his tracks, these people are going underground because the congressional investigation has been uh, convened to investigate yeah. the Black Panther Party and all these things that have been happening. And um, I, I get this uh, note uh, order to get rid of all the weaponry illegal weaponry of the party. And so I spent two days uh, crawling in crawl spaces, digging up uh, weapons, uh, going in attics, and collecting all these weapons, they, machine they guns, 50 caliber machine guns, anti-aircraft weapons, M16s, AK-47s, you know, so all these weapons that we accumulated over the years. And I have to dump it off these a Marin County, uh, the Marin Bridge, you know, at three in the morning. <laughs> I had to make two trips. I got the longest U-Haul truck you could get. Yeah, how many but, weapons do you think? Oh, God, it took me two days. It took me two days. And even then, when I thought I was finished, I get back to my house, and I'm laying across the bed, and I look in the closet, and there's about four M16s in the closet. So I got to take those down. I go throw them in the open estuary. And then uh, um, I get in a confrontation with Bill Cosby. I'm passing out some flyers for Huey's upcoming trial. And uh, I get in a confrontation with Bill Cros Cosby. And he 
you know, talked about Huey. And uh, I have no defense for Huey because everything he says is true. Mm. And about a week later after that, I, I leave the Black Panther Party. Then I meet someone who's, who was in the party who leaves as well, and he says it's a good thing you left because Huey was going to have you killed. So I had left just in time, which I always seemed to be one step ahead of mm-hmm. whatever danger mm-hmm. was coming. When you say leave, what did that what did that mean to leave the party, or what did that entail? Well, you know, for most people, when people left the party, they left, and they didn't tell nobody. They left at night. Mm-hmm. You know, they left right. at night, and they they didn't take anything with them, but yeah, maybe their their bare essentials. You know, yeah. they 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 just left in the middle of the night. But I, I didn't feel that I, I, I wasn't going to leave that way. You know, it had been 10 years. I had given everything I had. I wasn't going to leave like that. Now, mm-hmm. I told Big Bob, Huey's bodyguard, uh, that I wanted to take a leave of absence for a year. He called Huey and got Huey to okay it. And then uh, I left. Mm-hmm. Now, did you, did you ever expect to live that long? Oh no, none of us, none of us ever, none of us never expected to live um, very long at all, because there were over 30 party members that were killed from 67 to about 1972, so no, I I, I never expected to live, Uh, none of us expected to live to be, you know, too long, you know. Mm So, so then after you left, did you come? You came back up to Seattle? No, I didn't because I couldn't leave Oakland. You know, mm-hmm. I had too many memories there. There were mm-hmm. too. I was tied there. I was tied there. Even though I had gotten a threat from Huey, uh, when I helped somebody else to leave, when I took another Panther to the airport to go to L.A. to leave, and Huey found out about it and had Big Bob call me and tell me I had 24 hours to leave town. Mm-hmm. Um, even then, I still didn't leave. I just you know, hid out in San Francisco and just, you know, was careful of mm-hmm. where I went and what I did. And then that situation just cooled down? Or yeah, because because the party was going down, you mm-hmm. know, people were leaving and, mm-hmm. you know, pretty soon there was, you know, people were leaving, so. Um, uh, so I, my, I could have had, came back, my father was going to get me a job at Boeing. Uh, they wanted, their parents wanted me to come back and go to school at the UW. But I had been on the other side for so long that I, I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't see myself going from what I had done, been doing to now going to college. Mm. You know, I had been on the other side of the law for so long. And mm-hmm. I had that adrenaline rush, mm-hmm. I had become addicted to it. And I tried to get a job. I, you know, got some jobs, and it didn't work out. And I met some people, and I got involved in the criminal uh, life. And um, you know, for a year, I was involved in. I sold some cocaine, and I got involved in embezzlement, and made a hundred thousand dollars in a year, and went on the run from the FBI for about a year, and uh, eventually, you know, was caught and um, came back to Oakland and got out and, you know, started, um, you know, putting my life together and, mm-hmm. you know, worked Did you serve time over that? I did. Yeah. I served about a year, mm-hmm. about a year. Mm-hmm. And um, became a substance abuse counselor and, mm-hmm. you know, eventually I did move back to Seattle. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so let, uh, I guess we start to wrap up, but, t- but tell me about the kinds of work that you then went into um, back it's here in Seattle. The story. It is a hell of a story. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, the kinds of work that you ended up doing uh, back then. Uh, well, you know, at first I started off as a substance abuse counselor in Oakland, and I did that for a while, and I was, I did really good at it, even though I had never abused substances before. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was when I first started. I started working at, at a, first a detox, and we started open up a big um, uh, live-in uh, uh, recovery program. Mm-hmm. And these guys said, and he said, man, you ain't ever been no drug addict or alcohol. How are you going to teach us anything? But I just had that natural way of empathizing with people, mm-hmm. and I became the best counselor on the staff. Mm-hmm. 
And I even brought in some of the things that we had done in the Black Panther Party where I helped them to open up a, 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 a clothing program mm -hmm. within the, in the thing and doing yeah. some other things. And um, uh, I had an evaluation that I had to do, and I had to go down and meet with the executive director. And the executive director was this, he had a degree, he was a doctor. He was over, he had, over the West Oakland Health Clinic, and he was also a doctor at several hospitals. And he hired everybody that came in, and he fired everybody. So it was like this control. He was a control dude, you mm -hmm. know. And he had a big giant house in Sonoma County, and all this stuff. Sure. So I go in to see him for my evaluation, and there was one little thing wrong with my evaluation. And he says to me, he's sitting in his big leather chair, and he says to me, "Dixon, I hear you've been fucking up." I said, oh. "I just," I said, "Man." Fuck you, kiss my motherfucking ass, and walked out. You know, because I, I had been through that shit with somebody else, with Huey, and I wasn't going to go through that with nobody else. So I walked off the job, and um, I was able to get unemployment, but they, did, they fought tooth and nail to keep me from getting unemployment. I was told, man, nobody ever gets unemployment from, from these people, but I was able to get it. And um, so. Mm -hmm. I went up to uh, Northern California, worked on a marijuana farm for a couple of months, and had people selling marijuana for me. <laughs> Eventually, I came back to Seattle because what happened was the crack cocaine epidemic hit. All right, you're right. And uh, that's what my next next book is going to be about. It's going to be what happened in the '80s mm -hmm. and how all that cocaine came in mm -hmm. and how it affected the black community. Oh, how, right. And I, I saw what it did to Oakland. It was just oh. It's like a wave, a black cloud. Just mm -hmm. it was open was such a vibrant place in the '70s for black people. We called it Chocolate City. We had a black mayor. We had black nightclubs, and oh man, it was just a great place to be. Then all of a sudden, this thing hit, and I saw it hit, and and, and I had friends and party members who were addicted to cocaine, and I and everybody else was selling it, and teachers and everybody, man. It was just a mess. So I came back to Seattle. Uh, a month after I've been to Seattle, here comes the epidemic in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Zoo. And my, I bought my girlfriend from Seattle with me. She was addicted to cocaine. I didn't know it. And so I, we had two kids, and I was trying to keep her from being addicted, and you can never do that, you know. And so, you know, I struggled with that. And Became a gang counselor, worked with youth, and you know that's a whole nother story, you know, which I'm going to talk about in my second in book. book. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And what are you doing now? Well, I started a nonprofit organization about ten years ago, and we opened up a transition housing program for eighteen to four, twenty-four year olds, and we started youth leadership project in the high schools. We're in five different schools. We started the first media literacy program in a high school here mm -hmm. in Seattle. We took uh, a group of kids to the World Social Forum in Brazil right. on several occasions, and um, and uh, I got burnt out on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I finally got my book finished, mm -hmm. and uh, I got behind on paying my federal income taxes for the nonprofit. I wasn't a good administrator, yeah. and towards the end, I really d I was really tired of doing that. I really yeah. wanted to write, yeah. and so I. I in August, I became separated from Central House. Okay. The the uh, transition house is still going on, mm -hmm. but I got separated from that, and, mm -hmm. which was you know I was able to get unemployment. I filed for my Social Security, and I in September, I had a big uh, book opening for my book. My book came out in September seventeenth, mm -hmm. and I and I went on a uh, on a book tour. So up. one thing replaced the other. Yeah. So in July, I'm gonna start working on my second book. So you've been going around with the with the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah this book, yeah. talking to a, a lot of people. There's a lot of um, young people that are have a lot of questions, and mm -hmm. they 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 are really hungry. How did you do it? And 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 you know, how were you able to you know sacrifice yourself so selflessly and you know, how do we stop police brutality? Mm -hmm. How do we do this? How do we do that? You know, I was going to say because some of the, I was going to ask you about the legacy of your work, 
because some I know like the health clinic mm-hmm. survives and things mm-hmm. like that. But then the the, the same issues are here. Yeah. Too, especially with yeah. police brutality. Yeah. And, and worse. Things are much, much worse. Because we don't have the unity that we had. We don't have the unity among black people. We don't have the unity that we had as people, working class people, uh, and poor people that we had back then. The way um, you were describing your neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, 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 you know, individualism started getting pushed in the 1970s and, and, and you know, narcissism is very much a part of our culture now. Mm-hmm. And this whole individualism and materialism that really, you know, Ronald Reagan really kicked off with the neo-economic um, uh, policies and, and mm-hmm. deregulations. It just really has taken this country down the drain. Not the fact, mention the fact that he was responsible, along with George Bush, for flying in all those shipments of cocaine that devastated the black community. Not only devastated the black community, but it's affected the whole economy of America um, because all the resources that have had to go mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, dealing with, with that crisis. And, the, and now we have two and a half million people in prison. You know, most of them, 60% of them are Latino and black males. Yep. You know, that the crack cocaine uh, addiction really has devastated the black community. It just destroyed our families, destroyed our community. We don't have community anymore. We don't have the type of family structures that we had anymore. We have kids uh, raising themselves. Uh, you know, the cultural value system that we had when we were growing up does not exist anymore because we had a cultural value system that existed prior to 1970s and 80s, you, you know. talked about growing up with two-parent families. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, and people yeah. stayed together. Even though they didn't get along, they stayed together for the family, mm-hmm. you know. That was the most important thing, whether they got along together or not. And, and you don't see that kind of sacrifice and commitment anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, um, let me just ask you if there's anything else that, that or anything I didn't ask about or anything else that you um, thought I should have asked or that you'd like to, to say for, to, to wrap um, up? No, I, that, that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. I've been, I, I came back to Seattle uh, two weeks ago because I had five events up there, up mm-hmm. here that I had to go to. And so I've been talking, oh man, I've been really busy. Every day this past week I've had and the speaking event that mm-hmm. I've had to go to, and I bought Elaine Brown up here on Thursday, along with Cha Cha Jimenez from the Young Lords, and we had a nice big event at the University of Washington, which was really there was a well attended, as uh, packed audience, and it was really turned out mm-hmm. to be a really a great event. Great. So you're still in touch with with Elaine and other people. Oh yeah, yeah. Elaine and I are good friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she came to my book event in Oakland along with Erica Huggins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank amazing. you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.